Did you see the um, the chart that I sent, or do you think, or do you have something else? I got your email, and I think you sent me the wrong thing. What? Oh dear. <laughs> uh, because uh, you sent me the uh, the one that had nothing in it, so it was just uh, oh, okay. it was the one I had sent you. So I don't. <laughs> So I don't have any of your comments. So I have, I have, I, I, uh, I let me see. Here. Okay. Well, <laughs> I don't know if it's worthwhile now. I'm try to resend it. Uh, let me see here. Boop, boop, boop. I can would have time to use it if she sent it now. Um, I I probably won't be able to put it up on my family website before the fireside but i will definitely be able to put it up after so if both of you could send me that you know after at any time i will update it and put it put it up okay so if anybody is uh, in here listening to this uh we're just trying to figure out how we can get everyone's uh everyone's stuff together on one piece of paper so that uh, you know people can know where we're what we're talking about when we're doing these firesides so that's what we're talking about right now all right so i'm just sending you the other one do you have a visual to show uh there is a visual in there i just took the old testament student manual bookmark visual so that i just threw that in there for the time being um but uh okay. but yeah because that was the only thing i could find i think that it's one of those things that somebody needs to, to sit down and create a, a better visual for it um because it there really wasn't yeah. a lot yeah there's some i mean there are some good ones that the church did but even like the bookmark it's so wide and what we want is like the first half so seeing the what we want to see was i felt was kind of difficult like putting it on a screen i don't know maybe you got it to work all right Hmm. Three and four, I'm gonna have to uh to do something about for the uh as I go through these. It's very interesting. I'm gonna have to redo those. Well, everyone, thank you for joining us on this fireside. We got 27 people in here. We're going to get it going June 6, 2021. We have two guests today, and we're going to be going over lecture on faith number two. Really excited about these lectures on faith because uh, I've always loved them. And uh, as I've said repeatedly, they're one of the one of the single biggest influences uh, as far as a book or a teaching or a anything that has influenced my life. So I'm really excited about going over them. And President Nelson in his in the last uh, conference um, really, really gave a powerful talk on faith and then referenced the lectures on faith. And I thought, here's a the, uh, uh, as good a time as any to get something out there on this. Um, get some firesides out there, get some people talking about the lectures on faith and what it really means to have faith because there are so many problems going on right now in the church and with the, not with the church itself, within the church, the members. Um, problems that we're having with our faith that we would not be having these um, conflicts or debates or, or any of this if we actually understood what faith meant and uh, and what how it on whom and what it rested uh, et cetera et cetera so it's really um an important thing for us to, to to really understand so i'm really grateful for everyone taking the time to learn about this and to um come and 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 read and the guests that are showing up and talking about these lectures on faith uh, it's really humbling so we're going to start with a prayer and then we will let the two guests here introduce themselves and then we'll get into this Heavenly Father, we thank you today for all that you have blessed us with. We thank you for the opportunity to meet the saints. And as far as of thee, we ask you, Father, for that spirit to be with us and help us to um, feel the confirmation of the Holy Ghost when we come across truth and as we learn the truth. Father, we ask a uh, blessing that you would help us to learn some new things tonight to keep our faith 
well as United. And we pray you would help the technology to hold out while we have this fireside and help us to be uh, attentive and rather reverent and just be asked for in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, yeah, just a question. I, I put my, my Bluetooth headphones on. Can everyone hear me okay? It I... sounds a little weirder and more grainy than it did before. Okay. All right, let me just take these off then. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, that's, that's better. All right. Mm-hmm. All right. We'll let the two of you introduce yourselves. Um. Well. Okay. I guess I can go first. Um. So. So yes, I do have my um. My YouTube channel, Building Zion, that I've been doing for. Or is it working on? three or four months now and um so i'm just excited to be able to do this um fireside on the lectures on faith i had um actually thought that maybe i should do some videos on the lectures on faith and then mike is like hey we're gonna do fireside so i was like oh sweet um but i remember I remember finding the lectures on faith, like I didn't even know they existed until I went on my mission. And then um, somebody had given me a book, which I still have to this day. And, um, and I, you know, remember reading those things in there. And, and actually, when I was in high school, I remember I was asked to give a talk in sacrament meeting. And came to the conclusion as I was studying for my talk that faith was power, a principle of power, which I had never heard anyone tell me before. And I feel like I got some strange looks when I got up in church and said that. And um, it wasn't until, yeah, and I remember my parents were like, where did you hear that? Anyways, um, so it wasn't until I went on my mission and I got this book. And it says it literally in there. <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> I wasn't crazy. And so I've just, um, I've loved the book since and, you know, learning about faith and how to implement it in my life and actually uh, use faith as a principle of power and rely on, on God fully. And um, so I will, I will pass my time over all right, everybody. I'm uh, Brett Thompson. I'm uh, living in East Tennessee um, as of now, and I um, came to find Micah on YouTube about a year ago, and been listening, listening pretty steadily since. Um, I've learned quite a bit more, and um, this channel's been this channel and um, a few other channels like Hiram Andrus, um, Light and Truth, and a few others have really been the the shot in the arm that I needed to to revive my testimony, and so. Just glad to be here, and um, um, hope we can learn something together. All right. So, as always, what you're seeing or what we're going over today, I provide in a Word document and a PDF, and we're going slowly as things are progressing, transforming what you're seeing here into an audio file and throwing that up as well. You can find that in the description box of the video. So, a lot of people will come in and they'll ask, who's talking right now? They'll ask, um, where can I find some of these people? They'll ask um, a lot of questions that if you just look in the description box of the video, hopefully if I haven't uh, messed something up, it'll be there in the description box of the video. So if you want to uh, get a copy of the Lectures on Faith for free, we provide a, a, a link for that as well um, on our, our family website. But the actual lecture that we're going over at this time is built into or worked into the actual Word document that we're going to be going through. Um, those not familiar with the lectures on faith, the way that, that they're run, the way that, that, that they're put together is that there's a lecture, so there's um, like a talk or, or doctrine, and then at the end of it, what, they're, what you'll find is that there's a series of questions. And then in the questions, most of the time, he'll put 
references at the end of the question to let you know where you can go and find the answer in the lecture above. And then underneath the questions, they then provide answers to the questions that they've just asked you. Okay, so what we're going to be doing is going over these lectures on faith or the way that we've been going over these lectures on faith is that we start with a series of questions. So I'm going to hopefully uh, phase over here to this first series of questions. And uh, I'm not liking the way this is looking. So people were asking about my the visual and it's I'm saying, yeah, I don't like the way this is looking. So let me see if I can change this because I don't think that you're getting it all in there because these are big questions. So let me see if I can switch this out. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it cuts off right off of Centers for Life. And... Yeah, is that what you're seeing too? Yeah. yeah. Okay, let me see here. Yeah. Let me switch it out. You might just have to read it and I don't know. Uh, where am I at? June, 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 June. So what, what I'm going to do is, yeah, we're going to read the questions here. Let me switch this out here. See if this works. Is that, is that better? A little? Kind of? Mm, it looks the same to me. There we go. Um, now we cut off the top. We got the bottom, though. Okay, well, I have and it. I have it sitting there, so hopefully it's right. Almost there. It's oh, zoom out a little more. Okay, good, right there. All right, got it. Okay, so I might have to be doing this for all of them because these these are big questions. <laughs> and so what we have, because these are a little bigger than my normal questions. So because we we've jammed a bunch of these together. And so if you go to the bottom of the lecture on faith, what we're going to be doing is starting with the questions. Now this is questions one through five, and I'm going to read them. Is there a being who has faith in himself independently? Who is it? How do you prove that God has faith in himself independently? Is he the object in whom the faith of all other rational and accountable beings centers for life and salvation? How do you prove it? Okay, so these are the questions. Now, he tells us to go up to the top and read the, the, these sections of the lecture to get the answer. And so now I'm going to read the lecture. So what we're, the order that we're going to be going in is I'm going to read the question, and hopefully you'll be able to see the question at all points in time on the screen. I'm then going to read the lecture. I'm then going to read Joseph's answer that he provided. And then we're going to toss it over to uh, Marlene, and then we're going to toss it over to Brett. And they're going to add their thoughts on it. So that's the process that we're going to go through this. And I've said this before in, in previous lectures on faith. I absolutely love this style of studying. If you can get into this style of studying, your growth in learning will, will take off exponentially. If you can just learn um, how to follow these series of questions and answers following the um, the spirit and back to the scripture. So we're going to go to lecture uh, it, the lecture number two, and we're going to read, having shown in our previous lecture, faith itself, what it is, we shall proceed to show secondly, the object upon uh, object on which it rests. We here observe that God is the only supreme governor and independent being in whom all fullness and perfection dwells, who is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient without being of days or end of life, and that in him every good gift and every good principle dwells, and that he is the father of lights. In him the principle of faith dwells independently, and he is the object in whom the faith of all other rational and accountable beings centers for life and salvation. From the foregoing we learn man's situation at his first creation, the knowledge of with which he was endowed and the high and exalted station in which he was placed lord or governor of all things on earth and at the same time enjoying communion and intercourse with his maker without a veil to separate between we shall next proceed to examine the account given of his fall and of his being driven out of the garden of eden and from the presence of the lord now, Joseph Smith's answers to his questions, the one that we're seeing here on the screen is, there is, it is God. Because he is omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient, without beginning of days or end of life, and in him all fullness dwells. 
Ephesians 1, 23, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Um, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. He is, as it says in Isaiah 45, uh, 22, look unto me and ye shall be saved all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is none else. Romans 11, 34 through 36, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again. For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever. Amen. Isaiah 40, from the 8th to the 18th. O Zion that bringeth good tidings, or O thou that tellest good tidings to Zion, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, or O thou that tellest good tidings to Jerusalem, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God, behold the Lord, uh, uh, Lord your God will come with strong hand, or against the strong, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold his reward is with him, and his work before him, or recompense for his work. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather his lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young who hath measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and meted out heavens with the span and comprehended the dust of the earth in a measure, weighted the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who hath directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor hath taught him with whom took he counsel and who instructed him and taught him in the path of judgment and taught him knowledge and showed to him the way of understanding behold the nations are as a drop of a bucket and are counted as the small dust of the balance behold he taketh up the isles as a very little thing and lebanon is not sufficient to burn nor the beasts thereof sufficient for a burnt offering all nations are before him as nothing, and they are counted to him less than nothing and vanity. Jeremiah 50, verses 15 through 16. He, the Lord, hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom and stretched forth out of the heaven by his understanding. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth he maketh lightning with rain and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasure first corinthians 8 6 but to us there is but one god the father of whom are all things and we in him and one lord jesus christ by whom all things and we by him and uh, i would just say if you haven't noticed by now joseph smith um in answering the question used almost entirely scriptures it was just scripture after scripture after scripture after scripture and so if you want those references you can find them in the lectures on faith but uh this is how he taught and another thing that's amazing about how he's doing this because he you have to understand these lectures on faith were given to um, um people who were about to go off on missions and they were going to bring forth the book of mormon but all but what they had at that time was the bible and what he's providing here are all references to the Bible. And so um, he does, it's a very good um, reference point that if you're a missionary and, and you're wanting to try to teach these principles, he's given you a chain of scriptures here uh, to be able to teach this principle to somebody uh, using just the Bible. So anyway, now we're going to shoot this over to uh, uh, Marlene. Okay. So it is almost impossible for us as mortals to comprehend immortality. I have sometimes thought on immortality and have tried to wrap my head around it and still to this day cannot understand how something could have no start. I can comprehend no end but no start. That honestly blows my mind. Uh, DNC 3, 1 through 3 says, 
The works and the designs and the purposes of God cannot be frustrated, neither can they come to naught. For God doth not walk in crooked paths, neither doth he turn to the right hand nor the left, neither doth he vary from that which he has said. Therefore his paths are straight, and his course is one eternal round. Remember, remember, that it is not the work of God that is frustrated, but the work of men. So his course is one eternal round. We know that we too are as immortal as he is, um, he not having a beginning or end, again, blows my mind. When the mortality we have taken on dies, we will return to our previous immortal spiritual state. Through the atonement and res resurrection of Christ, we will again take up our bodies as immortal and not mortal. To understand our relationship to him as immortal beings, let's look at Abraham 3, 16 through 19. If two things exist, and there be one above the other, there shall be greater things above them. Therefore, Kolob is the greatest of all the cocoa beam that thou hast seen, because it is the nearest unto me. Now, if there be two things, one above the other, and the moon be above the earth, then it may be that a planet or a star may exist above it, and there is nothing that the Lord thy God shall take in his heart to do but what he will do it. Howbeit that he made the greater star as also if there be two spirits, and one shall be more intelligent than the other. Yet these two spirits, notwithstanding one, is more intelligent than the other, having no beginning. They existed before, they shall have no end, and they shall exist after. For they are nolam, I guess that's how you say it, nolam, or yes. eternal. And the Lord said unto me, These two facts do exist, that there are two spirits, one being more intelligent than the other. There shall be another more intelligent than they. I am the Lord thy God. I am more intelligent than they all. If God is more intelligent than they all, then in his own progression, if faith is a principle of power and action, he would have learned a perfection of action and a perfection of power, understanding perfectly, perfectly the laws that govern the universe and how to perfectly act to eternally move forward in progression. If he is greater than they all, then there would be no other who understands the universe, man, and laws better than he. He's, it stands to reason that he and he alone would be able to have full confidence in himself, knowing that he would fully complete all righteousness. And if one being in the entire universe is greater than they all and is guaranteed to complete with all righteousness, then he is the one being in whom we can depend on fully and completely and in whom our faith can draw without doubt that he will complete with all his promises alma 42 13 now the work of justice could not be destroyed if so god would cease to be god um in the um october 1971 general conference elder richard l evans gave a talk called Should the Commandments Be Rewritten? And uh, I just love this quote. It's kind of food for thought a little bit. He says, There are many things, my beloved brethren and sisters, that I know and you know are there because our Father said so. Close quote. And I will pass it over. All right. So, um, going back to just uh, we we've heard a lot of a lot of scripture and a lot of uh, verbiage. Now, the original question was: Is there a being who has faith in himself independently? Who is it? How do you prove that God has faith in himself independently? Is he the object in whom the faith of all other rational and accountable beings centers for life and salvation? How do you prove it? Um, you know, this is this is funny. When I I first read this, I, I never really considered God having faith in Himself independently. But then I started thinking about it. I was like, well, well, hold on now, Brett. You know, I I have, you know, I started asking how do how does God have faith in Himself? And 
so then I asked myself, well, Brad, how do you have faith in yourself? And I was like, well, because I know what I can do. I know that I, you know, that I can work on houses and I can do this and this and that. Um, and so with, with God, it's, it's the same thing. He has faith in himself because he, he's amassed so much knowledge and so much power and, and so much ability. Um, and he's probably been doing this for, for quite a while, um, before he, he had us. Um, so how, how do you prove it? Um, honestly, it, it comes down to, you, you have to get to know him. Um, and that, that happens a lot on your knees and by talking to him and, and listening and obviously having scripture to reference and to learn from is, is an essential element. Um, but I think ultimately it comes down to, to what you learn by the Holy Ghost. Go ahead, Micah. All right. So I'm going to skip on to the, the next one here, and hopefully um, we can do it. If there's any questions on the first set of, uh, on the first set of questions we've just, just gone over. Uh-oh. Are we losing Micah? Uh, yeah, it's... Uh... Uh, now it's back. Oh, weird. I could hear you. I'm work. I'm just. I wasn't saying anything. Sorry. I was uh, working on the next question. Can we oh. see it now? Can we see the question? That's what I was doing. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any questions? Okay. Nobody has any questions. Okay. Good. So I'm gonna read the next one here. Sorry, I went silent there because I was uh, working tech, which means uh, everything needs to stop. So. <laughs> So the question is, how did men first come to the knowledge of the existence of a God so as to exercise faith in him? What is the object of the foregoing quotation? Okay, so then he, this is the lecture, and this is a little bit longer here. But in my opinion, this is one of the more important things uh, said in, in this, uh, gone over in this lecture, some, some mind-blowing things. Um, are taught here. Um, in order to present this part of the subject in a clear and uh, conspicuous point of light, it is necessary to go back to show the evidences which mankind have had and the foundation on which these evidences are or were based since the creation to believe in the existence of a God. We do not mean those evidences which are manifested by the works of creation, which we daily behold with our natural eyes. We are sensible that after a revelation of Jesus Christ, the works of creation throughout their vast forms and varieties clearly exhibit his eternal power and Godhead. Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. But we mean those evidences by which the first thoughts were suggested to the minds of men that there was a God who created all things. We shall now proceed to examine the situation of man at his first creation. Moses, the historian, has given us the following account of him in the first chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning with the 20th verse and closing with the 30th. We copy from the new translation. And the Lord God said unto the only begotten who was with him from the beginning, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And it was done. And the Lord God said, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of the only begotten created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. And the Lord said unto man, Behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you. It shall be for meat. And again, in Genesis 2, 
verses 15 through 17, and then verses 19 through 20. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it. Nevertheless, you may choose for yourself, for it is given unto you. But remember that I forbid it. For in the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and commanded that they should be brought unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle, and to the fowls of the air, and to every beast of the field. Moses proceeds, And they, meaning Adam and Eve, heard the voice of the Lord God as they were walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees in the garden. Uh, and the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, Where are you going? And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I beheld that I was naked, and I hid myself. And the Lord God said unto Adam, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I told you that you should not eat? If so, you should surely die. And the man said, The woman whom you gave me and commanded that, I, that she should remain with me gave me of the fruit of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this which you have done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. And again the Lord said unto the woman, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception in sorrow. You shall bring forth children, and your desire shall be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And the Lord God said unto Adam, Because you have hearkened unto the voice of your wife, and have eaten of the fruit of the tree of which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it. Cursed shall be the ground for your sake. In sorrow you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to you, and you shall eat the herb of the field by the sweat of your face. Shall you eat bread until you shall re return unto the ground, for you shall surely die. For out of it you were taken, for dust you were, and unto dust you shall return. This was immediately followed by the fulfillment of what we previously said, man was driven or sent out of the garden or of Eden. Two important items are shown from the former quotations. First, Adam, or first, after man was created, he was not left without intelligence or understanding to wander in darkness and spend an existence in ignorance and doubt. On the great and important point which affected his happiness, as to the real fact by whom he was created or unto whom he was uh, amenable for his conduct. God conversed with him face to face. In his presence, he was permitted to stand, and from his own mouth, he was permitted to receive instruction. He heard his voice, walked before him, and gazed upon his glory, while intelligence burst upon his understanding and enabled him to give names to the vast assemblage of his maker's works. Secondly, we have seen that though man did transgress, his transgression did not deprive him of the precious knowledge with which he was endowed relative to the existence and glory of his creator. For no sooner did he hear his voice than he sought to hide himself from his presence. Having shown then in the first instance that God began to converse with man immediately after he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and that he did not cease to manifest him, uh, himself to him, even after his fall, we shall next proceed to show that though he was cast out from the Garden of Eden, his knowledge of the existence of God was not lost, neither did God cease to manifest his will unto him. We next proceed to present the account of the direct revelation of, which man received after he was cast out of Eden, and further copy from the new translation. After Adam had been driven out of the garden, he began to till the earth and to have dominion over all the beasts of the field and eat his bread by the sweat of his brow, as I, the Lord, had commanded him, and he called upon the name of the Lord, and so did Eve, his wife, also. And they heard the voice of the Lord. 
from the way towards the garden of Eden, speaking unto them. And they saw him not, for they were shut out from his presence. But he gave unto them commandments that they should worship the Lord their God and should offer the firstlings of their flocks for an offering unto the Lord. And Adam was obedient unto the commandment. And Cain went into the field and talked with his brother Abel. And while they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and slew him. And Cain gloried in what he had done, saying, I am free. Surely the flocks of my brother will now fall into my hands. But the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries unto me from the ground. And now you shall be cursed from the earth, which has opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, she shall not henceforth yield unto you her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond, vagabond also, you shall be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, Satan tempted me because of my brother's flocks. And I was also angry, for his offering was accepted and mine was not. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me out this day from the face of men, and from your face shall I be hid also, and I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond in the earth. And it shall come to pass, every one that finds me will slay me because of my oath. For these things are not hid from the Lord. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoso, uh, whoever slays Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. The object of the foregoing uh, quotations is to show to this class, the way by which mankind were first made acquainted with the existence of a God, that it was by a manifestation of God to man, and that God continued after man's transgression to manifest himself to him and his posterity, and notwithstanding they were separated from his immediate presence, that they could not see his face, they continued to hear his voice. Adam thus being made acquainted with God, communicated the knowledge which he had unto his posterity. And it was through this means that the thought was first suggested to their minds that there was a God, which laid the foundation for the ex exercise of their faith, through which they could obtain a knowledge of his character and also of his glory. Not only was there a manifestation made unto Adam of the existence of God, but Moses informs us, as before quoted, that God uh, condescended to talk with Cain after his great transgression in slaying his brother, and that Cain knew that it was the Lord that was talking with him, so that when he was driven out from the presence of his brother and he carried with him the knowledge of the existence of a God, and through this means, doubtless of his posterity, became acquainted with the fact that such a being existed. From this, we can see that the whole human family, in the early age of their existence, in all their different branches, had this knowledge disseminated among them, so that the existence of God became an object of faith in the early age of the world. And the evidences which these men had of the existence of a God was the testimony of of their fathers in the first instance. Now that last that last line, I want to reread one last time, and I want people to be thinking, having faith as the brother of Jared when I read it. Okay, read it one last time. And the evidences which these men had of the existence of a God was the testimony of their fathers in the first instance. So now let's go to Joseph Smith's answers. Okay, so that was the lecture that he said the answer's in there. Now he's going to give the answer to the question that you should be seeing on your screen unless something has been messed up. And Joseph's answer is as follows. In order to answer this question, it would be necessary to go back and examine man at his, at his creation, the circumstances in which he was placed, and the knowledge which he had of God. Okay, so he's going to go backtrack a little bit and reteach some things. First, when man was created, he stood in the presence of God. Okay, that's the first thing. From this, we learn that man, at his creation, stood in the presence of his God and had most perfect knowledge of his existence. 
right? You're standing in his presence. That's a perfect knowledge. Secondly, God conversed with him after his transgression. So we talked with them after they were kicked out of the garden. From this, we learned that though man did transgress, he was not deprived of the previous knowledge which he had of the existence of God. Now, what does that mean he's talking about there? So that's talking about the veil. So thus we know that when he transgressed and was kicked out of the garden, there wasn't a veil placed on that knowledge, right? We, we have a veil placed on our mind of the knowledge of the pre-earth life. But what he's saying here is that obviously when Adam and Eve left the garden, they were not deprived of the previous knowledge that they had whilst in the garden, right? They still had that knowledge of the existence of God. Thirdly, the third thing that he says here is that God conversed with man after he cast him out of the garden. Then fourthly, God also conversed with Cain after he had been slain or after he had slain Abel. And he obviously provides the references here, but we've already gone over those. It is that it may be clearly seen how it was the first thoughts were suggested to the minds of men of the existence of God and how extensively this knowledge has spread among the immediate descendants of Adam. Okay, so now, um, so let's look at how we personally came to a knowledge of God. It may have, so us personally in our lives, it may have come in a variety of ways. Your parents may have taught you or you, or they have, may have taken you to church. You may have first heard of God from a friend, teacher, or other extended family member, or even on TV. However you first heard of God, the idea was planted in your mind to the possible existence of such a being. Their knowledge of God, whether correct or incorrect, came from a source previous to themselves and was passed down in a verbal or written tradition. If you choose to believe in such a be being, that belief would have to have grown of the merit of your faith in such, um, let's see, sorry, grown of the merit of your faith in such a being as you yourself had never seen God face to face or heard him with your own ears. I mean, as far as we know, maybe someone out there has, but, you know, <laughs> no one, as far as we know, and, and um, today, uh, maybe the prophet, you know, things like that. But as far as we go, as far as I go, I'll speak for myself. How about that? As far as I am, I learn from my parents. I learn from going to church, reading the scriptures, from others' testimonies. And from that, I then exercised faith to learn about him and gain a testimony of Christ and God. So 2 Nephi 25, 26, and we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, and we write according to our prophecies that our children may know what to what source they may look for remission of their sins. All knowledge of God originated with Adam and Eve. They walked and talked with God. When Adam and Eve left the garden, they taught their children. And then in Moses 5, verses 2 through 5, And Adam knew his wife, and she bare unto him sons and daughters, and they began to multiply and replenish the earth. And from that time forth, the sons and daughters of Adam began to divide two and two in the land, and to till the land into ten flocks. And they also begat sons and daughters. And Adam and Eve... And Adam and Eve, his wife, called upon the name of the Lord, and they heard the voice of the Lord from the way toward the Garden of Eden, speaking unto them, and they saw him not, for they were shut out from his presence. And he gave unto them commandments that they should worship the Lord their God, and should offer the first things of their flocks for an offering unto the Lord. And Adam was obedient unto the commandments of the Lord. So we know that Adam and Eve, after leaving the garden, when they called upon the Lord, heard his voice from the garden, giving them commandments. We do know that if the children of Adam and Eve also heard the voice of the Lord from Eden when they called upon him. Um, oh, sorry. Sorry, my typing, I did it a little fast, so it's a little weird. Okay, we do not know 
if the children of Adam and Eve also heard the voice of the Lord from Eden when they called upon him, but Adam and Eve would have taught their children of God and his commandments. And I'll pass it to Brett. All right. Okay, so um, some, some, some thoughts on this. Um, first, um, the knowledge of God was known um, even, even with Cain. So um, just like with um, Nephi and his brothers Laman and Lid, uh, Lemuel, um, they, had, uh, they were rebuked by an angel. And Cain was rebuked by the Lord. So it, it seems like in, in a lot of dispensations of the world, or at least a couple now, there's the Lord makes himself known in one way or the other to um, both the, the good guys and the bad guys, for, for lack of a better word. Um, also, um, I think it's funny how the, this Joseph chose... The lectures on faith and in the lectures of faith and this dissemination um, of the, the knowledge of God and um, it's wrapped around around the creation narrative um, so I think there's there's probably something extra to learn um, about that as far as the endowment is concerned um, um, also the the knowledge of God was was has been spread throughout um, much of the world, if not all the world, in, in ways we're not even aware of. Um, for example, um, the Chinese alphabet, um, there, it has in it the, um, the, this creation narrative, or at least the early version of the Chinese alphabet had it. Um, there's videos on YouTube you can find that, that break this all down. Um, and so if, if it got to China, then every place between um, where where the ark landed in China or Jerusalem in China, um, then it was known. So um, that and also the the Egyptians um, have something similar to this. Um, so the knowledge of God has been has been spread all throughout the world, um, and because uh, it it was needed, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was was. Uh, divinely inspired all of it was so Micah go ahead all right so uh, is there any questions this is the time to ask the questions while I fix the visual and so I will go silent here that's not me cutting out well it might be me cutting out oh. but <laughs> so there's one from looking up LDS last days that says so did Adam have faith and um I mean, I would have to say to that, yes, even though, you know, we know of, of things, uh, you know, we, we use the definition, faith is um, belief in things not seen, but you have to remember that um, Satan, he walked and talked with God and yet did not exercise faith in God. Um, who else? We know that Enoch walked and talked with God. Um, Cain talked with God. And uh, I was going to mention that later, but, you know, doesn't hurt to now. Um, Enoch, he walked and talked with God, but exercised faith toward God and to God um, to the exaltation of, of him and his people. They were lifted up unto God. And um, Cain, who talked with God, chose to turn completely the other direction and not exercise any faith in God, but but love um, Satan instead. So you know, I'd have to say he definitely had faith in God. Yeah, and, and um, Adam having faith, um, I want to expound on that a little more. Um, yeah. Adam had faith of the existence of a Creator. That doesn't necessarily mean that he that he had a complete and perfect faith in all the aspects of the creator and all of the, the different principles. So the, the meaning of, of the word Elohim is, it means God, but not just God overall. It means God in varying degrees and abilities or in many different things, a, a plurality of things. He has got over. He is the God of 
the water, God of the earth, God of the heavens, God of, you know, we can keep going on. But I think that Adam, he had faith in the existence, but that doesn't mean he had a, a perfect faith in all of the, the attributes of, of deity necessarily. Um, now, we, we don't know what what Adam and Michael had as far as um, what, what he came through the veil with or what he may have remembered or what he was shown by revelation later in his life. Um, but I know in my life, it's I, I have to learn God and come to have faith in God in, in slices. And each slice that I get just just completes another piece of the whole pie. And, and the more I, I see that, that pie and coming together, the more I, I have faith in the, the pieces I don't know. And Mike, are you ready yet? <laughs> Sounds like he's in the other room. No. I, oh, okay. Well, I put the, I put I, the, I, I put the mic down. I, you know, I, I, there's a somebody in the um, um, oh my goodness, somebody in the uh, Discord uh, named Roquin, and he's been nailing me really good on references, and so I, I love it. And so I, I, I am terrible at remembering references, but I quote stuff all the time. And I was just thinking in my head uh, of in the Book of Mormon where it says that. Uh, um, that when somebody knows something, it is not faith because it, he he knows the thing. I think it's Alma thirty two, and so um, it, it, it. But it's but faith has the understanding of of what they're describing is and what I, I'm reading here with uh, Reba. So that uh, she says here. So it is why Joseph called it faith unto salvation. We use our faith to draw close to God. Now that is something. Um, that's so here's here's an example if i've been to let's say the statue of liberty okay do i have faith that it exists or that it did exist or do i know that it exists the the, the answer would be i know that it exists because i've been there but then when i teach my children and i say hey there is a the statue of liberty over there do they know or are they exercising faith that has been passed down from me? They're exercising faith that has been passed down from me. But then how do I exercise faith in the Statue of Liberty? I exercise faith in the Statue of Liberty by rounding up my kids and going on a trip to the Statue of Liberty. The act of getting my kids together, the act of making the plan, the act of getting in the car, they're all acts of faith. And the faith is, I know that when I get there, that statue will be there. But that doesn't, but but once my, me and my family get there, my kids will no longer have a faith that the Statue of Liberty is there. They'll know it's there. But that so there's the the acts of faith, but then there are things that get turned into knowledge. But just because you have knowledge doesn't mean that you don't still act in faith, right? And so everything that Adam was told to do from the garden, when when the voice was uttered from the garden, and 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 Adam just did it, right? Those were acts of faith. But he he didn't. There there was no doubt in his mind of the existence of God because he knew him. He saw him. And so um, hopefully that makes sense, a little bit of a differentiating between those two. Um, sometimes I wonder if I've confused everyone. Or, um. <laughs> no, no, I'm, no. Mike, I, I'm, actually, I'm actually just I – mean, because of this, this talk, I've started to try to, to understand that, that principle and try to pick that apart some. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a really, really good thing that we all need to understand. Yeah, I think you both gave great examples as uh, um, as to um, understanding faith, who had faith, and what you can have faith in. All right. So hopefully that answers those questions. If Okay, so we'll move on. So I have it up there. Hopefully everyone can see that. And if uh, we can't see that, please somebody, uh, be, being one of you two, say I, I screwed that up. I think I can see it all. It goes down to world. Okay, so that's the next questions. So we're going to read those. What testimony had the immediate descendants of Adam in proof of the existence of a God? 
had any others of the human family besides Adam a knowledge of the existence of God. Now, see, here's a, a that key word, right? Besides Adam, a knowledge of the existence of God in, in the first instance, right? So once again, we, going back to what I said before, Adam knew of the existence of God, right? Because he saw him by any other means than human testimony, right? So hopefully this is explaining a little, uh, uh, making a little more sense after my, I don't even know what you call it, metaphor, <laughs> example. How do you know that the knowledge of the existence of God was communicated in this manner throughout the different ages of the world? And then he takes us to the lecture here. So we're going to read the lecture here. And after many days, an angel of the Lord appeared appeared unto Adam, saying, Why do you offer sacrifices unto the Lord? And Adam said unto him, I know not, but the Lord commanded me to offer sacrifices. Okay, here's the here's the acting of faith. And the angel said unto him, This thing is a similitude um, of the sacrifice of the only begotten of we the Father. Them. Oh, we lost people? Uh-oh. Can, can you not hear me? Mike, are you back? Uh... Yeah, it cut out about ten seconds ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can hear you. The I can hear you, and I was reading, so it, it might not cut out. It, I don't. That's weird. Okay, so where were we? You were good on my end. So oh, I, I was know. good there. Okay, good. Um, yeah. So okay, this is in similitude of the sacrifice of the only begotten of the Father, who is full of grace and truth. And you shall do all that you do in the name of the Son, and you shall repent and call upon God in his name forever. And that day, the Holy Spirit fell upon Adam and bore record of the Father and of uh, and the Son. This last quotation or summary shows this important fact, that though our first parents were driven out of the Garden of Eden and were even separated from the presence of God by a veil, they still retained a knowledge of his existence and that sufficiently to move them to call upon him. And further that no sooner was the plan of redemption revealed to man and he began to call upon God, then the Holy Spirit was given bearing record of the Father and Son. Moses also gives us an account in the fourth of Genesis of the transgression of Cain and the righteousness of Abel and of the revelations of God to them. He says, in process of time, Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. And Abel also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had no respect. Now Satan knew this, and it pleased him. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. And the Lord said unto Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door, and Satan desires to have you. And except you shall hearken unto my commandments, I will deliver you up, and it shall be unto you according to his desire. The reason why we have been thus particular on this part of our subject is that this class may see by what means it was that God became an object of faith among men after the fall, and what it was that stirred up the faith of the multitudes to feel after him, to search after a knowledge of his character, perfections, and attributes, until they became extensively acquainted with him, and not only commune with him, and behold his glory, but be partakers of his power, and stand in his presence. Let this class mark particularly that the testimony which these men had of the existence of a god was the testimony of man. For previous to that time, that any of Adam's posterity had obtained a manifestation of God to themselves, Adam, their common father, had testified unto them of the existence of God and of his eternal power and Godhead. For instance, Abel, before he received the assurance from heaven that his offerings were acceptable unto God, had received the important information of his father that such a being did exist who had created and who did uphold all things. Neither can there be any or be a doubt existing on the mind of any persons that Adam was the first who did communicate the knowledge of the existence of God to his posterity, and that the whole faith of the world it cut out. 
world from that time down to the present is in a certain degree dependent on the knowledge first communicated to them by their common progenitor. And it has been handed down to the day and generation in which we live, as we shall show from the face of the sacred records. Okay, that's the end of from the lecture there. Um, hopefully when you're reading there, maybe some, hopefully something's clicking there about why when God narrowed things down to 10 commandments, uh, one of those 10 was honor thy father and thy mother. Um, let's go into Joseph's answer here. The testimony of their father is the answer. And after they were made acquainted with his existence by the testimony of their father, they were dependent upon the exercise of their own faith for a knowledge of his character, perfections, and attributes. Okay, so they got the, the they got their faith from the testimony of their fathers, and they were dependent upon that. Then they had to exercise their own faith to eventually gain a knowledge of his character, profession. Uh, perfections and attributes they had not for previous to that time that they could have power to obtain a manifestation for themselves the all-important fact had been communicated to them by their common father and so from father to child the knowledge was communicated as extensively as the knowledge of his existence was known for it was by this means in the first instance that men had a knowledge of his existence by the chronology obtained through the revelations of God. Okay, I guess that's me. I was writing a response here, but I can read. Um, let's see. So only by faith in the testimony of another has the belief in such a being as God continued from the time of Adam to the present day. Even those who have had miraculous experiences with deity did not come by them without a previous understanding that God existed. One example, of course, we know is Joseph Smith, who is shown to have had a knowledge of God in Joseph Smith History 111. When he says, while I was laboring under the extreme difficulties caused by the, the contests of these parties of religion, religionists, I was one day reading the epistle of James, first chapter and fifth verse, which reads, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. If he had no previous knowledge of God passed down to him from his family, and the many religious sects in the area, he would have had no inclination of searching for the truth of God, nor his true church, nor the inclination to even search the scriptures and ask God for such knowledge. Because of his knowledge in God, he turned to the source by which truth of God can be obtained and chose to put faith in the words written in, in the book that was indeed a promise given of God that he who asks will receive. Joseph asked, acting in faith toward God, and he received. And that's all I have for that one. So it's your turn, Brett. All right. Yeah. Yeah, my, my answer isn't very long either. So the question again is, what testimony have the immediate descendants of Adam in proof of the existence of a God? Had any others of the human family besides Adam a knowledge of the existence of God in the first instance by any other means than human testimony. How do you know that the knowledge of the existence of God was communicated in, in this manner throughout the dis different ages of the world? Um, because it's, it's, it's all, over, all over the scriptures. I mean, us sitting from this perspective thousands of years later, years later, we have lots of, lots of examples. Um, but for them, um, what evidence do we have? It would be what they did, how they behaved. Um, one of the things that, that I, 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 that's oddly enough, which is a testimony to me of the knowledge of God, was that um, in one of the earlier um, questions or one of the other earlier answers, um, Cain says that he who finding me will, will slay me because of the 
it's basically the secret combination that Cain made. So the very fact that we have secret combinations implies there's Satan, which implies there's God. Um, and that even continues to to this this day. All right, so Micah, go ahead. You know, the, the wonderful thing about these doctrines is that if you understand the doctrine or the principle, like the Elder Bednar was describing in the last conference, but it, it's been described many times before him, that if you understand principles, right, that you then have a lot of other doors of, of understanding unlocked. And this is one of those things that that seems might seem simple, but it's one of those things that once you understand it, there are other things that begin to click, Okay. Now, so, and you'll be able to see it. So here's an example. I see it all the time in the church with parents that will constantly say things like oh, it, to their kids or to kids, it's, it, they need to get a testimony. They need to get a testimony. They need to get a testimony. This constant talking down to your kids, like, like it's not the parent's job to instill a testimony in the child, Right there's that constant, like the responsibility is I, I've taken it off of my shoulders and I've dumped it on the kid. Now, a lot of people might be listening to this lecture and go, oh yeah, this is common sense, but who also might be guilty of what I just described. And, and what that proves is that you might've heard it, but you don't understand it. The testimony is given by the fathers and then they go off then they go off and act on that and get their own testimony. Well, what does that mean? That means it is your responsibility as a father and as a mother to tell them. Well, we first get it yourself, but then to look them in the eyes and be an honest person and say, I know certain things. I know certain things. And you might not know those things right now, but you can rely on that. You know me. You know me. I am an honest person. You know me. You can rely on that testimony until you've gained your own. And you need to learn to act on what I'm teaching you and gain that testimony yourself. But see, if we knew the lectures on faith, if, if we had this principle in mind that we wouldn't even know about God if it wasn't for the, this passing down. And we wouldn't even know about it. Now, if we knew that, then, then we would know then why would I expect my kid just to figure this out on his own? It, it, it doesn't make any sense. It is my responsibility. It is your responsibility. It is our responsibility as saints to gain the testimony and then instill that testimony in the child so that they can then take that flame and go off and make their own fire. But if you don't give it to them, if, if, you, if you don't instill that, then to expect them to just do this on their own, uh, it, it's it's not it's uh, it's you're you're shirking your own responsibilities. Can they still learn it? Yes, but where are they learning it from? Then you say, well, they learn it from the scriptures. Well, who are the scriptures? The scriptures are the record of our fathers. So all you've just done is just dump the responsibility from you onto other uh, to your grandparents. That's all you've done. Now, there's nothing wrong with using the scripture. There's nothing wrong with using your grandparents, but it will never replace the testimony of a parent who's worthy. And, and, and that's what this lecture on faith really can teach us, is that we as parents, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility because this is the first instance that faith will be introduced, not only into the world, but to our children. It, it, it's, it's a universal pattern. That, it, that we learn, we, we, we get handed some stuff, we then go off into the world and figure out what's right and what's wrong, you know, to, to, you know, to, to confirm it, and then we need to then uh, do that to our children. So, little commitment there. Um, stop trying to dump that on other people. Uh, stop trying to dump that on your children. Um, you know, I remember when I was uh, really young, uh, I was listening to a talk, and once again, I don't have a reference, so somebody's going to murder me on this. Um, uh, Gordon B. Hinckley, Gordon B. Hinckley, who was the prophet at the time, he said, uh, he said pretty much with tears in his eyes, I remember him getting really emotional. He said, if, if you don't have a testimony right now, lean on my testimony, lean on my testimony. I know, I know that this church is true. 
And I remember thinking at that time, I remember thinking, I want to be that kind of person. I want to be the kind of person that that knows something for himself and that can be an anchor in my children's life and other people's life so that I can I can say that with a surety. That when when people are floundering and they're have they're having troubles, that I can be like that and know for myself and say, look, I know some things. And um and uh, you can know those things yourself and uh, and pass that faith down um, so that others can go and find the same thing that you found, right? And then obviously the second part of that is then how, how do the fathers pass that on? They have to open their mouth. And so they have to find the stuff, but they have to open their mouth and share it. And so uh, we need to open our mouth and we need to share it uh, and we can't shirk those uh, stewardships and responsibilities. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm good. Well, that was it. I'm just going to say I was going to switch to the, the next one. Okay. Well, I, yeah, I, I got some, some comments ready to add on that. So, so um, I, I got two batches of kids. I got one older one, one set of older ones that are, that are 20 and 18, and I got two that are 10 and 9. Um, my, my first ones, I, I wasn't there um, spiritually. I mean, I had a, a, a great testimony myself but i honestly i was i was afraid of sharing it with with my kids and how they're turning out as adults now reflects that i'm not, I'm not, not saying they're they're burning down busloads of nuns or anything but they they don't have a testimony of, of the gospel um and so as as i'm learning more about about um like how man just says about the, the holy holy order and about us being teachers to our um, our children, um, I'm taking that a lot more seriously with with these these two, the the two younger ones, and um, it it's it's not easy. It wasn't easy at first to get comfortable talking with the gospel up to my own kids, and as I know that's that's freakishly weird to hear, but it, it wasn't for me because the gospel to me is it's such a personal and, and intimate thing with me. It's it's the very closest thing to my heart. And so trying to, to share that with others, it it, it takes takes courage. Um, and even talking with my kids about it, it took a lot of courage to, to get comfortable talking with it. But but now that that I am um uh, like Micah said, I, I've got whole whole vistas and worlds of opening um, of knowledge opening up, not only to me, but I'm realizing all the things that that I need to to teach my kids. And um, actually, in Doctor and Covenant this this past week in the in the um, Come Follow Me, uh, the Lord says, you know, that we are responsible to teach our kids the doctrine of faith and repentance and baptism. And I, I noticed that the Lord, like, just kind of dropped it right there. He didn't say teach him everything in the gospel. But I was like, you know what? That's not enough with, 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 with this world. And so um, what Micah was saying about, about instilling into your children the, the gospel um, I, I always assumed that my kids would be pioneers like, like I was that, you know, I, I'm, I'm a first generation convert and I had no family and just a few friends. I had to learn everything myself and I had to, had to develop every bit of testimony almost on my own. Um, but, and so I, I naturally assume that, that, that my children are, are going to be like that and they're going to do that. But that's not what the numbers show so far so far you know half my kids are off the gospel wagon and the other two are to be decided um so what mike was saying about instilling that's that's a proactive action that's not passive and that's that's absolutely right um my my, my kids are starting to to question and you know they're starting to to try prayer and have prayer, and they're they're not having responses, they're not having answers, but um, I I know it will happen, but it's 
I guess I'm just not. I'm sorry. I'm just realizing that it's it's up to me to instill that faith in them to to carry them until they do get answers for whatever reason. So um, that's all I got to say about that. That's that's exactly right. And we all, you also have to understand that even if you do all that, even if you've done all that perfectly, there's still a chance that you might have a cane, right? So like it's your job to instill that. But it's still their job to go off in the world, exercise faith in that, and go go figure it out themselves. So, but it first has to come from you know the, the father. Adam had to first instill it into to Cain. Cain knew what he was doing. Right? There's a reason why he became a son of perdition. Um, so we're gonna jump on to the the next one here. Now the next series of the lecture on faith here, it does a huge jump. Now it goes. These are all questions that go from number 11 to 143, okay, a lot. So the lecture lays out <laughs> in great detail, great detail, the genealogy from Adam on down, okay? And it, it, so it's a huge amount of questions provided. And these questions that if you go through the lecture, they're all something along the lines of like, who is so-and-so and who is so-and-so's son? And how old was so and so? Now I would recommend taking the time to go and read over that, but I'm not going to do that in here because that would just be way too long and way too um. I don't I don't want to say uh, sloggish. Yeah. Can I answer it? Um, falling asleep. There you <laughs> I go. I was listening to this earlier. And I was like, Come, why is this in here? Why are we listening to this? Come on. Well, very good, very good. So those were good questions. So. Below, uh, I've added here a visual um, that represents everything that was discussed in this lecture, um, or pretty well. Um, and uh, Marlene has also sent a visual that I didn't have a time to put it in here, but I'll put that one in as well. It'd be really good if somebody from this group also took the information there and provided an even better visual of all this stuff. Now, but instead of going over that in this fireside, this is a lot of what I would classify as the who, the when, the what. I would rather ask and have answered what Brett just said. I would rather have the following questions dealing with the why asked, okay? And uh, the why are what I have here, that these are my questions here that I put for the this section of Lecture on Faith 2, and that is why, why in a series of lectures on faith would Joseph Smith take the time to lay out the genealogy from Adam on down? Why did Joseph Smith believe it was important in this to also differentiate the genealogy pre-flood and post-flood? I thought that those were two really good things that answer a lot of um, a lot of questions if people really take the time to think about. So I will let um, the other two give their thoughts, and then I will give my thoughts. So we'll jump over to Marlene, Brett, and then I will uh, answer this question. All right. So, um, when you are able to look at a chart of um, how it is that, that Adam through Noah, how their lifespans correlated, um, w you'll be able to see that the descendants of Adam, Seth through Lamech, all lived at the same time as Adam. Lamech was the father of Noah. So Noah was the only one, well, Noah and Shem, because Shem was the son of Noah. Noah and Shem and, and his, uh, his sons, they were the only ones who, um, you know, that are talked about specifically in the Old Testament, were the only ones who did not live at the same time as Noah. Okay, or I'm sorry, as Adam, same time as Adam. So Seth, from Seth to Lamech, they would have all learned from the first-hand testimony of Adam and Eve. And many of these may have also dwelt in the valley of Adam and Diamond with Adam. If, when calling upon the name of God, Adam and Eve heard the voice of God, some of their descendants dwelling in Adam and Diamond may have heard his voice as well, gaining their own first-hand witness of God speaking unto them. 
we do know from scripture that both Cain and Enoch walked and talked with God. One slew his brother and became the son of perdition, and the other raised up a righteous people who were later taken up unto God. Uh, Moses 5, 22 through 24, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, thou shalt be accepted. And if thou canst not uh, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and Satan desires to have thee. And except thou shalt hearken unto my commandments, I will deliver thee up, and it shall be unto thee according as his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. For from this time forth thou shalt be the father of his lies. Thou shalt be called perdition, for thou wast also before the world. And it came to pass that Cain took one of his brother's daughters to wife, and they loved Satan more than God. DNC 107, 48-49, Enoch was 25 years old when he was ordained under the hand of Adam, and he was 65, and Adam blessed him. And he saw the Lord, and he walked with him, and was before his face continually. And he walked with God 365 years, making him 430 years old when he was translated. Enoch and his people, knowing God, exercised their faith unto life eternal. Cain, on the other hand, also knew God. His descendants would have known God by Cain's own mouth, but chose to not love God and put put the faith of him. Wait, sorry. Uh, let's see. But chose to not love. Like I said before, I wrote this quickly, so this does not make any <laughs> sense. <laughs> okay. Um, out of Cain's own mouth, but chose not to love God and to put their faith in him, but rather chose to love Satan. Okay. Then we want to go to Moses 8, 12 through 21. And Noah was 450 years old. So now we're moving forward. Cain has died. I mean, um, uh, Adam has died. So now we're up to Noah. And he was 150 years old and begat Japheth. And 42 years afterwards, he begat Shem, Shem of her, who was the mother of Japheth. And when he was 500 years old, he begat Ham. And Noah and his sons hearkened unto the Lord and gave heed, and they were called the sons of God. So this is important, that they were called the sons of God. Um, we did a fireside on this. I don't know, it was several weeks ago, um, becoming the sons and daughters of God. And I don't know um, if you guys remember what it means to become the sons and daughters of God, but it means that they are those who have made covenants with God, temple covenants, and have come to a an, 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 such an understanding of God as they are becoming like God. Okay, so that's Noah and his sons. And when these men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, the sons of men saw that those daughters were fair, and they took them wives, even as they chose. And the Lord said unto Noah, The daughters of thy sons have sold themselves, for behold, mine anger is kindled against the sons of men, for they will not hearken unto my voice. And it came to pass that Noah prophesied, and taught the things of God, even as it was in the beginning. And the Lord said unto Noah, My spirit shall not always strive with men, for he shall know that all flesh shall die. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years, and if men do not repent, I will send in the floods upon them. And in those days there were giants on the earth, and they sought Noah to take away his life. But the Lord was with Noah, and the power of the Lord was upon him. And the Lord ordained Noah after his own order, and commanded him that he should go forth and declare the gospel unto the children of men, even as it were even as it was given unto Enoch. And it came to pass that Noah called upon the children of men that they should repent, but they hearkened not unto the words. And also after they had heard him, they came up before him saying, so this is what the, these children of men, um, this is what um, Moses has written about these men, calling them the children of men, but they came up before Noah and, and said, 
behold, we are the sons of God. So they are claiming that they are as Noah and his and their sons and his sons. Um, have we not taken unto ourselves the daughters of men? And are we not eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage? And our wives bear unto us children. And the same are mighty men, which are like unto men of old, men of great re renown. And they hearken not unto the words of Noah. So they are claiming that they are the same as Noah and their sons, um, but um, have obviously do not have faith in God because they were not rightfully called the sons of God. They have not lived up to their covenants. So even if they did make covenants, they lost those, uh, those covenants somewhere along the way. All right, so it is important for us to understand that pre-flood, everyone living would have either walked and talked with God, been translated and taken up to God with Enoch, would have heard the voice of God, would have learned from the testimony of Adam himself, would have learned of God from someone who learned from Adam, or would have learned of God from someone who had done one or more of the before mentioned items. First or second hand witnesses of God pre flood were abundant, and yet by the time Noah was born, the majority of people had become so wicked that the earth was ripening for destruction, thus provide proving that it is by faith that we believe in God and not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 6 through 7. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. The distinction made between pre and post flood is important because all those who came after have come to know God through others' testimonies, thus meaning that they would have to walk indeed by faith and not by sight. And it's your turn, Brett. All right. Oh, okay. So a um, few thoughts on this. Um, first, a, a kind of an oddball thought. I just I realized that um, maybe it took so long, or people lived so long because there was, they were, Earth was, progressing from Kolob to its current orbit. Maybe that's why they lived a thousand years, but that's a side thought. Uh, okay, so um, I noticed Joseph Smith mentions Zion a lot in the Isaiah passages and the earlier questions. Um, also, um, prior to Adam's death at 939 years, um, when he was 933, I believe, um, they all gathered in the Valley of Adam on Diamond. And at that gathering, Adam was able to bring his entire his posterity, the sons of God anyway, into God's presence. So they created Zion, or a, a Zion, and they brought people back into the, the presence. Now, um, what was said earlier about they were um, was it Laman and Lamech, Lamech, Lamech were saying that we are also the sons of God. They were they were claiming that, that they they were the sons of God. Adam at this time and his posterity all the way through Israel, um, Israel was was captured and enslaved. They they practiced the holy order. And um, the Laman and or Lamech, they were claiming they were sons of God. They were they were they had a false holy order. They had a, a, a false religion, and but they were trying to claim that they were were the people of God. Um, and so, back to the original question: um, What testimony have men in the first instance why there is a God? What excited the ancient saints to seek diligently after a knowledge of God, a knowledge of the glory? of God. Joseph Smith specifically says glory of God, his perfections and att attributes. Um, they they knew of the holy order, and that's what what, what they were pursuing. It, it had been handed down by the fathers from them to them, and um, they were striving to get back in his presence. Go ahead, Micah. 
Yep, that's ex- that's exactly right. So the the first instance that we have to realize here is how much how much the uh, patriarchal order, the 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 holy order of the priesthood, um, didn't just stop with the priesthood. It was a it was a whole program that that was designed from the top down that uh, evolved that uh, centered around the family and uh, and uh, that it also it's what faith is built off of and so in a lectures on faith w- 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 yeah i'm glad that we picked that up that, that the holy order is is crucial to that so that's the first uh, which i talked about a little er- earlier in the comment section so we need to make that connection between the 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 holy order right the, the the patriarchal order as well as faith both being built into that system so that's the first reason why joseph took the time to 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 go through all of this um genealogy but there's a second reason why i believe and it, we get you get into it more in, in the others lectures on faith which is why i believe it was also early on in lecture two that this has gone over why this is actually in here why this is actually in here okay now i'll I uh, will bring up um, Elder uh, Parley P. Pratt. Now, Elder Parley P. Pratt, uh, many have uh, uh, have quoted, have noticed that I quote him a lot. Um, Elder Parley P. Pratt, in his in his book entitled "The Voice of Warning," and in, in uh, a number of of talks that he gave at conference that you can find in the Journal of Discourses, takes a very strong and a very aggressive stance against the interpretation of scriptures, figuratively and spiritual. Okay. He, he had an understanding that everything in the scriptures was plain and literal. Now, we just talked about how, you know, sitting through this, you might have been falling asleep. Well, guess what? Pratt sat through this. Okay. So there were people that sat in this hall and listened to all of that genealogy, all of it. Okay. They were in that building for hours listening to this. And what is this teaching? Every single question. How old was Adam? How old was Enoch? How old was was uh, uh, Lemech? Who was so-and-so's father? Would one ask those questions if they were not literal answers? The reason why they, he, we have that many questions asked and that many questions answered literally is because guess what folks the gospel is true and it is literally true there was literally a man named adam and according to his the reckoning of a year which we assume is the same uh, the amount of time it took him on earth at that time to travel around his or the sun where he happened to be he lived to be 900 years old we believe he literally lived to be that old. We believe that Noah literally got on an ark, and we believe that literally after the ark that things changed. There was a change made, a change that was significant enough to differentiate the time and the genealogy pre-flood and post-flood. What this teaches us, what this teaches us is, that the gospel is literal and it needs to be interpreted literal. There is a hundred questions that Pratt had to sit through in this class and and his you know brethren that were in the class too, going you know just like think about think about seminary and you've had to sit through this and then they're asking you okay how old was Adam and you're like oh gosh I can't remember how old nine three oh, seven oh my goodness he had to sit through this. And then he had to go off into the world and listen to members go, yeah, well, that's just figurative. That's just figurative, you know? We don't know how old. We don't even know. I mean, Adam might have not even been a real man. You know, Noah and the flood, eh, it's figurative. Might not have actually happened, right? He had to listen to this. <laughs> and that's why uh, people like Elder Pratt, who understand the lectures on faith, go, no, no. Our prophet of our dispensation made it really clear as I sat through this lecture, this is very, 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 very literal. And so um, I think that that uh, are two things that uh, um, that uh, are important to grasp on that and why there's a differentiating. 
Okay, we didn't, but we 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 believe that there was literally a flood, and uh, it changed the world as we know it, and and also for uh, reasons unknown. Uh, you know, it could be based off of uh, where the Earth was in in the solar system. Uh, we don't know. People's ages changed. They did not live as long, and so um, and that is literal. And so those are the two things that I think that we could gather from that. And I think that if you want to go through those, those and read those. Take the time to do it and look at the visuals and maybe create your own visuals. We believe that those men existed, that Adam literally and 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 Brett um, uh, brought up uh, Adam on Diamond. Um, Lad mentioned Adam Adam Indian Ahmed, but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, Adam on Diamond, and that is a literal place. That is a literal place that 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 a uh, Matt. Uh, is currently standing in. It, it is a place. It is a literal location. And a man named Adam stood there at one point in time. Like, this is all literal. And and the more we can wrap our head around that, that this is literal. These are your ancestors. We're all related to Noah. Okay. <laughs> we're all related to Noah. And we're all related to Adam. And if the more we can wrap our head around that, the more we can begin to exercise literally the faith as the brother of Jared. And so um, that's uh, my my takeaways for that. So we're going to jump on to the next one unless somebody has some questions on that. And I will switch it on over to question number five. Hopefully we can see it. All right. So I should have just clicked over. And this question is, what testimony have men in the first instance that there is a God? What excited the ancient saints to seek diligently after a knowledge of the glory of God, his perfections and attributes? In the lecture here, it says, we have now clearly set forth how it is and how it was that God became an object of faith for rational beings. And also upon the upon what foundation the testimony was based, which excited the inquiry and diligent search of the ancient saints to seek after and obtain a knowledge of the glory of God. And we have seen that it was human testimony and human testimony only that excited this inquiry in the first instance in their minds. It was the credence they gave to the testimony of their fathers. This testimony having aroused their minds to inquire after the knowledge of God, the inquiry frequently terminated, indeed always terminated, when rightly pursued in the most glorious discoveries and eternal certainty. Joseph Smith's answer, human testimony. And human testimony only. I just that that, that is a something that that once again, if people understood this, if members of the church actually understood this, that we, we say okay that maybe this is kind of a milky doctrine, but if people understood this, there is a lot of things that are said so often with members, so often that. If they understood this, they would understand what they're saying is false, okay? Human testimony and human testimony only, right? As I said above, it was the credence they gave to the testimony of their fathers. This testimony having aroused their minds to, to inquire after the knowledge of God, okay? The credence they gave to the testimony of their fathers is the, the answer to this question. All right, so um, so then once we have come to that first knowledge of God, it is then up to us to exercise faith unto exaltation or unto damnation. Two recent quotes have illustrated the exercising of faith to exaltation as Enoch and his people and as Noah and his sons or to the damnation as Cain and his family and the 
quote unquote sons of God who perished in the flood. Really the sons of man, right? Okay, so the first one was President Nelson, this last conference, in his talk, Faith to Move Mountains, he said, quote, Your mountains will vary, and yet the answer to each of your challenges is to increase your faith. That takes work. Lazy learners and lax disciples will always struggle to muster even a particle of faith. Close quote. So this next quote comes from the Journal of Discourses, uh, Volume 2, page 114. And obviously this is not a recent quote, but it was recently quoted in a conference recently. It says, quote, if the Latter-day Saints will walk up to their privileges and exercise faith in the name of Jesus Christ and live in the enjoyment of the fullness of the Holy Ghost constantly day by day, there is nothing on the face of the earth that they could ask for that would not be given them. Close quote. So that is faith as like the brother of Jared. It, um, it is those who live up to their privileges, exercise faith in Christ, are not lazy learners, and who are valiant disciples who will seek diligently after a knowledge of the glory of God, his perfections and attributes. May I be so bold as to say that lazy learners, lax disciples, and those who do not live up to their privileges are no better than those who were destroyed in the flood. As members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who have made covenants and have gained our own testimony of God, to be lazy learners, lax disciples, and to not live up to our privileges is to deny that, is to deny what we ourselves have come to know to be true. And your turn, Brett. Okay, so let me just go over the, the question one more time. How do men obtain a knowledge of the glory of God, his perfections and attributes? Is the knowledge of the existence of God a matter of mere tradition, founded upon human testimony alone, until a person receives a manifest manifestation of God to themselves? How do you prove it? Um, eh, scriptures, testimony of others... Um, Again, on your knees, talk to God, um, see how things, how He works in in your life, seeing how He, what He says to you. Um, but um, looking at Joseph's answer, by devoting themselves to His service through prayer and supplication incessantly, strengthening their faith in Him. Until, like Enoch, the brother of Jared and Moses, they obtain a manifestation of God to themselves. It is, from the, f from the whole of the first lecture of the second section, um, it's, it's, it's by that faith that we, we, we will obtain God's presence again. Um, by that, that line upon line, um, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. Um, learning that and walking that, I think that's actually how we, we might define um, walking with God. Um, so uh, that's about all I got. Micah, your turn? Yep. Um, I think you might have jumped on to the next question there. but uh, Oh, I'm sorry. No, it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. So the, the question here was, what testimony have men in the first instance oh, that there is a God? I did. Uh, what excited the ancient saints to seek diligently after a knowledge of the glory of God, his perfections and attributes. And what you're going to get with this question, so what I said is you, you people go, oh, there are a lot of members of it like, oh yeah, that's obvious, right? That's obvious. But then here's, here's my question to you. How many people have heard um, quotes or things said something along the line of, oh, I did nothing, the Holy Ghost did everything. How many people have heard things like that? Now, what is Joseph Smith saying here? They wouldn't have gotten to the Holy Ghost. They wouldn't have gotten to the confirmation phase at all. If not in the first instance that they had this, 
the human testimony, the hu and and he says and he repeats and human testimony only. And the credence they gave to the testimony of their fathers. And obviously that includes you or, or me as parents, but that also includes Nephi, right? Right that, that the scripture that um that Marlene read earlier that we, we, we write these things so that our children may know unto whom they may turn for a deliverance uh, and for salvation. Uh, we do this for our children. So what, what, what else has that become? It becomes our forefathers. Everything that we read in the scriptures, okay? That is a human testimony, okay? That is a testimony that that is born to us by our fathers, Okay? What you're reading is the testimony of Nephi. You're reading the testimony of Alma. You're reading the testimony of Mormon. You're reading these people's testimonies. That's what you're doing. And once you get that, once you or anybody for that matter, so it, or you're listening to me and or a prophet or you, you know some other member of your local branch or ward, and you hear that, and you hear that human testimony, that then excites the the inquiry. That then lights the mind on fire, and then they're, once they're aroused, they then inquire after the knowledge of God. Then they move forward. Then we can have the Holy Ghost start to work on them to, 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 um, uh, to expand the mind and the intelligence and bring all things to their memory, et cetera, et cetera. Then we can have uh, the next steps. And so um, we, there needs to be people bearing testimony okay it needs to happen and so too often than not i hear in the church that i you know i didn't even need to say anything i didn't need to say anything no brothers and sisters you need to say something mothers and fathers you need to say something you need to open your mouth you need to share the gospel and because that is what opens the door Okay, a lot of people have described this process with me, right? They listened to me and I upset them, right? They 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 hated me. They, they I don't I don't like Micah. I think he I think that what he's saying he is contentious. But what did it do? They then said, well, it excited something in my mind. It made me go, well, I bet I'm going to go and inquire further and figure this out on my own. But what started it? The start of it is a human testimony and human testimony only, right? As Joseph Smith said. And then people give credence to it in one way, shape, or form, and then they go off and figure out the rest. So don't, do, do, there's a reason why the Lord says that the, the person on the watchtower who does not raise the warning voice will be held accountable. Will the blood of the people will be required at the hands of the watchman. But if the watchman raises up the warning voice and the people heed not the watchman and they come in and kill the village, then the blood will be required at their own hands. The first instance is the testimony of the fathers. It is the testimony of those standing on the watchtower. So please, uh, it, this is one of those doctrines that you might think it's it's simple. You might think it's milk, but it's one of those doctrines that I know if we knew and had a testimony of, I wouldn't hear taught in church the stuff I hear taught in church sometimes. Okay, this is an important doctrine, and uh, people have been talking about in the chat about how the um, and, and and Brett was leading it that the scaffolding from the church is eventually going to fall, and we need to have these things in place. These are the things that we need to have in place. We need to have an, an understanding of this and built into us so that when these things start to um, lax off and we start to become much more family-oriented, patriarchal, holy order, we can do it. But we can't do it if we just think that the, the preaching of the gospel to our kids and to our neighbors and, and the talking of the gospel in general— now, that's, that's the Holy Ghost's job. It's going to go off and do this for us. I don't even have to open my mouth, right? I'll just kind of be a good person, be a good example, and stand around my kids, and they'll just get it by diffusion, 
right? It'll, it'll just somehow seep from me into them. No, the first instance always comes from human testimony, brothers and sisters, and I can bear testimony of that. We, first human testimony, and it will burn something into your mind and open it up, and then you will then you'll be left with a choice. And if you, it says, if you follow it, indeed, always, if you follow that in the right way, you will be rewarded in the most glorious of discoveries and eternal certainty. And I can bear testimony of that as well, that it will, it will always, if you just act, if you just let this open your mind a bit and go, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to check this out a little bit. I'm going to move, move forward with this and I'm going to pray more. I'm going to do, I'm going to try this. I can promise you. That when rightly pursued, and obviously Moroni goes over what is required to be right to rightly pursue something, right at the, at the end of the Book of Mormon, we have to have the uh, real intent, faith in Christ, sincere heart, right? Rightly pursued, we will be rewarded with the most glorious of discoveries and eternal certainty. Of, of that, I can uh, bear my testimony. And we will jump over to the last of the questions for uh, uh, lecture on faith number two. And as I'm changing this, people can ask questions. If they so desire, I'll just make a, a comment um, about uh, you know you're talking about um, you know letting that scaffolding fall and and um, you know I, I think if we look back to to COVID when churches were closed and everything and we were doing church at home, that would probably be a good. Um, uh, testing point, you know, something to look back on as how, how well we were prepared to teach at home. You know, um, at first there wasn't any of those, uh, zoom broadcasts for the meetings. And so we were just doing sacred meeting and things at home. And then when they started the zoom broadcasts, our family was like, well, you know, we're just going to continue doing it ourselves because our daughter couldn't speak English. So she wouldn't have understood anyways and um and we we did the the sacrament meetings at home we were doing the the young women goals together you know um family home evening and all these things and and um we felt kind of bummed actually when <laughs> when church actually started again <laughs> Yep. Um, not that church isn't good and we shouldn't and we should definitely be going if it is open and available to go we should definitely be going but um, but I think you know looking back on that is kind of like how Bednar, Elder Bednar talked about in food storage you know us knowing where we are in food storage and temple preparation how are we in being able to teach our children teach from home and be um, the God's mouth from our homes instead of just having to go to church to get that. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what what COVID to me felt like it was it was a proving and a testing and a wake up shot, um, mm -hmm. a wake up call. Yeah. Uh, and like I started learning about the Holy Order right um, soon soon after COVID started, and I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is it. This is what 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 we're being tested and what we're being driven to and so once i i got that and I, I i accepted that and i accepted the idea that that between covid not being here now and the forthcoming persecution against the saints we have no idea if we're even going to have ward buildings left mm -hmm. when, when that persecution is done so i'm i'm my plan a now is it's my job to teach my kids 100 percent if I have help from primary and, and other people and they get social interaction with other kids, great, but it's all on me. And I, I, I can't assume um, um, that, that anyone else is, is going to be there ever really to, to, to help out with it. Um, so, um, and it, it, this all ties in so well to the, the lectures on faith and where we're, where we're headed for a church. I think we're, where we have to head as a church, we've, we've been coddled with programs and, and stuff too long by, by, by teachers in primary and, and other teachers that, that, um, um, 
can't teach with the same kind of fire and the same kind of passion and they, they can't cater lessons um, just like individual parents can. Um, it's just like homeschooling versus um, public schooling. You can't, um, as a parent, you know how your child learns. You know what their 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 quirks are. You know how to even how their their schedule works. And you know sometimes some kids aren't you know very good in the morning and they get better in the afternoon. Other kids wake up bright and early and they they do great early in the morning. So um, the gospel is the same way. We can we need to custom customize it for our children and by accepting that responsibility and and fully embracing it not only are we going to be be better teachers for our our students or our children we're going to be so much more emotionally involved um not only in teaching them the gospel but also in 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 the fruits of what comes comes from that you know when when you get to your when your kids go get married in in the temple and you can sit back and go, wow, that's that's because of of, of what I chose to do. Um, um, of course, you know, not not entirely, but um, you 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 get that chance and that that choice. And I think it's it behooves all of us saints nowadays to to just start leaning that way, start planning on it, it's it's a hundred percent on us parents to to teach the children the gospel and um customize it for them i mean a lot of times with with my kids we we start talking about a lesson that we start off with and we we end up running on to other things in the gospel but that you know and it's it's fun and they're excited they're interested and you know we we may get off subject but you know all truth can be circumscribed into one great whole we'll eventually come back around to what, what we were going to teach um but um yeah so that's all i gotta say about that all right well last question last question lecture on faith number two um how do men obtain a knowledge of the glory of god his perfection and attributes is the knowledge of the existence of god a matter of mere tradition founded upon human testimony alone until a person receives a manifestation of god to themselves how do you prove it? Goes to the lecture here, or we'll go to the lecture here. We have now traced the chronology of the world agreeably to the account given in our present Bible from Adam to Abraham and have clearly determined beyond the power of controversy. Uh, well, apparently it's controversial today. <laughs> so this is wasn't at the time, uh, <laughs> right? It was literal at this time, right? Beyond the power of controversy that there was no difficulty in preserving the knowledge of God in the world from the creation of Adam and the manifestation made to his immediate descendants as set forth in the former part of this lecture, so that the students in this class need not have any dubiety resting on their minds on this subject. I don't not really don't know that word. Uh, do you know that word? Think dubious. Du yeah, it, 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 it's dubious. Oh, there's a Y Questionable, here. suspicious. Dubiety. D-U-B-I-E-T-Y. Well, no, oh, it just means... Dubiety is a, is a correct word, but it think of the word dubious, if yeah. you know that word. It's okay, so yeah, okay. Du dubious. Okay, good. That's what I would have guessed, but I'm not from... He has some really good old English words here that I have to look up every time I go. I think that means like this, but um, resting on their <laughs> minds on this subject, for they can easily see that it is impossible for it to be otherwise but that the knowledge of the existence of a god must have continued from father to son as a matter of tradition at least for we cannot suppose that a knowledge of this important fact could have existed in the mind of any of the before mentioned individuals without their having made it known to their posterity we have now shown how it was 
that the first thought ever existed in the mind of any individual that there was such a being as a god who had created and did uphold all things, that it was by reason of the manifestation which he first made to our father Adam when he stood in his presence and conversed with him face to face at the time of his creation. Let us here observe that after any portion, portion of the human family are made acquainted with the important fact that there is a God who has created and does uphold all things, the extent of their knowledge respecting his character and glory will depend upon their diligence and faithfulness in seeking after him. Until, like Enoch, the brother of Jared and Moses, they shall obtain faith in God and power with him to behold him face to face. Joseph Smith answers the question by saying, by devoting themselves to his service through prayer and supplication, incessantly strengthening their faith in him until like Enoch, the brother Jared and Moses, they obtain a manifestation of God to themselves. It is from the whole of the first lecture of the second section. Okay. Uh, it is by first learning of God, then exercising even a particle of faith that we first come to know God. Alma 32, 26 through 27. Now, as I said concerning faith, that it was not a perfect knowledge, even so, it is with my words. You cannot know of their surety at first unto perfection any more than faith is a perfect knowledge. But behold, if you will awake and arouse your faculties, even to experiment upon the words and exercise a particle of faith, yea, even if you can no more than desire to believe, let this desire work in you, even until you believe in, in a manner that you can give place for a portion of my words. It is then that we let that seed grow over time. And as we continue to put our faith in God, our eternal Father, fulfilling the commandments he has set out for us, taking upon us covenants and honoring those covenants, we too will become even as the sons and daughters of God, full of righteousness, being able to forever put all our faith and trust in our God. And as was written in the Journal of Discourses, quote, there will be nothing on the face of the earth that they cannot ask for, for that would not be, um, that they cannot ask for, that would not be given them. Close quote. And I say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so how do men, men obtain a knowledge of the glory of God, his perfections and attributes? Um, it, it's pretty much been been said um, thoroughly um, by first having um, faith in, leaning on someone else's testimony um, until you can get your own. And then go from there so Micah go ahead yeah that's that's it I I, I would just like to, to say that brothers and sisters um, we're living in a time period that was prophesied about from the beginning of time to this and having an understanding of the, the true attributes of faith and understanding these things will help us be able to move forward in the days ahead that, that, that there are so many things that once you know the principles and once you know the macro last day timeline and once you know what's coming, you'll see things. Like we're, we're talking about how that um, uh, there was a video passed around with Elder Cook going around the Nauvoo Temple talking about the lands that are being expanded upon that are now being called part of the temple lot. And all of a sudden people are looking at that and they're going, wow, I uh, this, this is now ringing true. I think I'm seeing something. We're now talking about how... <laughs> Right, I, I'm figuring something out here. That we're now talking about how uh, the the prophets and apostles are coming out and and trying to to get people to uh, to take the responsibility of parenthood and 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 instill this in their kids. And once we know these things, we'll go. Oh, now I know why. I I now know why. Too too often, and, and this is this is uh, this is my commitment to to everyone. Too often. We, we look at what a prophet is doing and we say, wow, that was prophetic. That was prophetic. And the truth of the matter was is that 
There was nothing prophetic in what was done. It was simply reading the scriptures and believing them. They read the scriptures. They know what's coming. They believe it, and they've and they've done. They've made preparations and told people to make preparations for what they know is coming. And then those things come because the prophecies will not fail. They will not fail. Every jot, every tittle, it's all going to happen. So if we know what's going to happen, if we know the doctrine, we know the principles, this is why fear flees from the prepared. This is why it flees from them, right? Once we hear the word, and if you're hearing the word right now by whatever means, and you're thinking, oh, I don't know, should I act? Should I do something? I pray that some part of your heart, as discussed, as Marlene just went over, some portion of your heart gets opened up so that you can just get a little portion of belief, a little bit to, of a desire to experiment. And then you can then move forward and open your mind and move into this. And I can promise you that you will you will be rewarded and reach those things like I we just went over in the last section. And by devoting ourselves to the Lord's surface through our prayer, through our supplication, incessantly, we will eventually have faith as the brother of Jared. And that is crucial to the last day timeline, obtaining that faith as the brother of Jared, rending the veil of unbelief, the open return of Joseph Smith, the redemption and building of Zion. If we don't understand these things, we will never be a fulfillment to them. If you don't know how to build a home, you're not going to accidentally wake up one day and walk outside and there's a home sitting there that you've built. Correct me if I'm wrong, Brett. But if you don't know how to do these things, they're not going to be done through you. You have to learn these things. You have to develop that faith. You have to develop that faith in Christ and this knowledge so that you can take part in these wonderful things. And that is that is my desire and that my commitment to everyone today. Learn these things. Get a testimony of these things yourself. And I give that commitment and, and the promise that from the Lord that if you pursue these things with a sincere heart, real intent, faith in Christ, that these blessings will be made manifest unto you. And I share that with you in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Um, yeah. So it, uh, to answer, answer your question, Micah, yes, you, you do have to know those things. You do have to build. Um, also just, um, while we're talking about Zion, um, um, and headed that way, I read a comment by one of the brethren, um, again, I'm also bad ref with references. He says that in in uh, New Jerusalem, we're all going to build, build our own houses. So um, we're going to be that family oriented, guys. Um, so yeah, that's, that's all I had to add. To that. All right. Well, we'll say a closing prayer and then we'll switch it over. All right. All right. Our dear, kind Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this beautiful Sabbath day. We're grateful for the chance to meet together as saints in whichever part of the world that we are. And we're so grateful for the blessing of technology that allows us to be able to meet as saints who are scattered across the face of the land and wish to um, talk with each other and discuss by by gospel as we know that this kind of thing would be impossible in in days past um, please bless us that we can truly learn how to be faithful truly learn to have faith in thee as the brother of Jared and as as Joseph Smith and as Moses and Noah, that we may be able to build Zion in our own homes and in our communities and, and um, fulfill the promises that thou hast given us. And we say these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.
All right. So um, some people were asked, were giving me the, the definition of that word. I, I have a pretty good grasp of what the definition is. I still know how to pronounce it. So get, somebody give me a pronunciation is what I was asking for. How would you pronounce dubiety? Dubiety? Yeah, dubiety. Dubiety. Okay, so dubiety. I like deity, but put a dub in front of it. All right, dubiety. Yeah, see, I, I had a, a good idea of dubious, but uh, I did, still, I'm not going to get that right. But dubiety, dubiety. All right. It, it's the pronunciations that kill me. Like, I have a, uh, I have a pretty good reading comprehension, but my uh, re- reading pronunciation is uh, is uh, leads something to be desired. <laughs> Let's just. Well, we all have to have our, our weaknesses to, to keep us humble. Yeah, I have I have plenty. So <laughs> I have I have enough. Okay, so maybe I don't. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't say that. And God's gonna be like, I'm gonna give you a couple more now. Um, <laughs> couple. <laughs> Couple dozen, couple dozen. Humility. There it is. Uh, you think you have enough here? Here now you can't talk or see. Oh man! Thank you. Ever- you know, on the reverse, if you take that and flip it around, if you want to advance your 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 um, salvation, you ask liberally for patience and for um, weaknesses or to have your your weaknesses known. And uh, he'll liberally show them to you. <laughs> yes, he will. And then he will help you make those weaknesses strengths. And so someday you will be an amazing uh, speaker there, Micah. Amen. Exactly. So- someday <laughs> it'll happen. Someday it'll happen. Well, thank you, everyone, for showing up to the fireside. Thank you, Marlene and, and Brett, for uh, taking the time to do it. The, the faith, the courage to come up and do this. I love these firesides and, and I love everyone's contributions. Everyone has a different a different way that they say things and uh, but we're all grounded on the same thing and so we can all arrive at the, the same conclusion. So that's just it, it, fantastic. I, I, I love you both. Um, Matt sitting there Matt sitting there in uh, New Jerusalem uh, pre New <laughs> Jerusalem. I I, I, I I really can't wait for that. I, I know that, and we get into this kind of back and forth about how we, we need to bind Satan in our own home and we need to start the millennium in our own home. And and, 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 I, and I, I am doing that and we are trying to do that. But there's also that level of, uh, uh, as Joseph Smith taught, that a righteous man isn't content with just saving his own family. His love will, will move on to the, all of, of the human family and won't be content until all those that can be saved are saved. There is a level that we eventually need to start looking out, right? There is a, what we take the fruit, right? In Lehi's dream where we eat that fruit and then we start looking for other people. You look for a family. We, we try to reach out and help other people. And I, I, I will, I will serve the Lord and I will be obedient until the day I die, regardless of whether or not I see new Jerusalem in my life. But man, oh man, uh, that does not mean that I don't pray and uh, and long for that uh, that assembly of saints uh, to become a reality uh, in my lifetime, and that we can see this shortly ahead. So, um, and I and I believe that I really do believe that so many people here have brought the spirit of Zion here. I I, I really do, and I think that uh, and that's what that's what we need. Yeah, yes. We're, we're going to keep that spirit of Zion in our own individual homes, but I, I, I th- this ability to go online and go to or talk to other people who also have this spirit of Zion, this this understanding of the redemption and building a new Jerusalem, it is a rekindling that that occurs for me every week or every time I have a chance to talk with any of you, and so I, I really appreciate that. So I would just once again, at the end, thank you all for the efforts that you've done to, to make my and bless my life, make my life better and bless my life. Oh, we thank you too, that you host these things and, and, you know, just do a lot of inspiring. And, um, so, you know, these things are a joint effort, you know, even 
people who are commenting and you know as we start to get to know some of the people commenting and seeing them on discord i'm like oh my gosh yes i know them and i start to know their voice and understand and and um um you know they're they're all people but I guess, you know, like I said in the prayer, there's no way we'd have, we would have known each other without coming online and, and, and talking together. And I think, I, I think that with as many people as there are in the world and the way that we are scattered across the planet, there is no way that this kind of thing could ever possibly happen without having technology like this. Like this, this kind of thing had to have, been reserved for when the technology was available for people to connect in this way yeah um i i completely agree with you um I, i've been having a thought about this group and in the discord group does anyone else have the thought or idea or impression that that we are the people in this group are we're like Mike was saying, we're the ones that are that are most pushing for Zion. I mean, now that we're we're going back to church and 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 our ward and, and wards and our ward activities, does anyone else feel like like if you brought this up in 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 the, in your ward that you'd be kind of looked at like a three headed alien? Um, not that that we're teaching some funky doctrine or or anything, but it, it's almost like the I'm I I'm afraid or I'm I think most of the saints are just so uh, disconnected from from the 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 idea of the future of what our our goal is um, to to become Zion that most most people even in the church are just are just they're just running through the motions. It feels like, um, and I, I wish there would be more teaching in the church about the the purpose of the gospel of Jesus Christ in every dispensation, in all ages of the world, has always been to build Zion and to bring us back into the presence of the Lord. That's the big goal. I mean, every, everyone thinks that it's it's for your eternal life in, in and, this life well right right i know I, I know everyone thinks that it, it's 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 in the next life but yes they forget it can start in and they don't realize once we get the the savior in our neighborhood walking our streets um you know chasing our our our, our dogs out of his lawn <laughs> then um everything changes we we have a member of the Godhead with us, and if saints can just catch a hold of, of that, and honestly have the the brazenness to to take faith and believe that that, that is possible, and and accept that that that's the goal, it, it changes everything, guys. The the uh, everything else falls by the wayside. I mean, your, your fears are sharing the gospel. Your your worries about anything worldly about what's going on in babylon and who the next american idol is and all that junk it it diminishes it disappears um so i i just i gotta wonder if if this this group is there other groups like this and is there anyone else having these conversations about about starting zion and if so, are are we going to be the ones who are like the 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 first pioneers into this this even thinking about New Jerusalem in this dispensation? I, I know not the first, but you know the first in, in in a few generations maybe. And so I'm I'm wondering if anyone else has has had thoughts of are we alone are, are we al alone in this, this thinking is there anyone yes. else even approaching this this subject matter and so i just wanted to ask that to, to everyone if you comment that'd be great um also if if you guys would in, indulge me for a minute my son he's standing here he wants to say hi to everyone real quick say hi, hello 
Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks, thanks, thanks for letting me do that. Um, I'm gonna turn it back over to Mike now, guys. Thanks. <laughs> was that Bo? Was that Bo? Is that, you said? that was Bo. Yeah, he's uh, he's being silly. Mike. Hey, Bo. Um, <laughs> yeah, you know the the thing isn't because so, there's there's two folds to that, right? Like there's there's do we want Zion, right? And I think there's a lot of people that do. I think there's a lot of people in the church that want Zion. They want it, right? They are the called. They have heard the call. But but how do we get Zion? That That's an even harder question, right? And I think that there's a lot of people that that, that, that that's where we start to break things down. So we break down along lines of, I believe that Zion's just going to fall out of heaven. I, I believe I don't have to do anything. I believe that Zion is is in my heart. I believe that I just need to go to church and pay my tithing and I don't have to, I don't have to, I don't have to actively be doing anything else, right? I can just be doing the status quo and that's good enough. But, but they still have a quote unquote desire for Zion. And so I, I kind of go back to the story of Jared and his people. They, their, their end goal was to get to the promised land, to build Zion as well. Like that was their end goal as well. But they got to the water's edge, and then they just kind of forgot. They just kind of forgot. And that was like, in my understanding of the parable of Noman and the olive trees, and what we did when we got to the Salt Lake City Valley is what we did. We, we got there, and we just kind of forgot. Um, you know, this is a time of peace. What what need hath my Lord of these things? Um, we forgot. And and just like the, peop the, the people of Jared, they, they forgot. And the Lord had to show up and, and say, hey, look, guys, I understand that this is a nice place and you've turned into a nice place and you're holding sacrament meeting on Sunday and you're doing all this stuff, uh, but you're not supposed to stay here on this beach. Like, this is not the end goal. This is not where we're supposed to end up. This isn't it. Wake up. Uh, we, we need to start building. We're surfing, what? We're not surfing, guys. Come yeah, we're not. On. Yeah, we're not surfing. We're not surfing. We need to build some dishes and we need to get them moving. And I think that I think that. Uh, you know, it it, 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 I'm sure it broke down on party party lines there, or not party lines, but fa I'm sure it broke down across some lines there too, when because we know that yeah, well, we can uh, that the brother Jared came down and said, hey, we need to we need to start building some ships. Okay, everyone wanted the promised land, everyone wanted Zion, but once again, we have to understand that these are humans. Do we believe that everybody in that group built ships? Do we believe they all were were building the ships? Do we believe that they all didn't murmur? Do we believe that they all got in the ships? Do we believe that none of them stayed behind? Like this is this is the, where we have to start. That that we all want Zion, right? But how many people are willing to give up something for Zion? What are we willing to do for it, right? Like, and somebody mentioned, I I, I just way back. I'm looking back up, but somebody mentioned President Iring. President Eyring brought up a, you know th that in the last conference where he said that, you know, you need to live right, but you need to be willing to give it up. You need to be able to, when the call comes, leave. And that is, so it's not just, it's not just about wanting Zion. It's about what are we willing to do to get it? And and that is something that um, I, I, I shouldn't say I feel, I know that there's a lot of that that is not as healthy of a number as we'd like to think it is if it was as healthy of a number as we thought it, it, it as we'd hope we wouldn't have the prophet of god coming out and, and and saying that you know lazy learners and lax disciples won't be able to exercise a particle of faith stop rehearsing your doubts among other doubters and, and saying what he said so um I, I believe there are other groups that want Zion, but you know th these are discussed all in Second Nephi, all of them. That there there were many groups that that were awoken up during this time, but there were but most of them had become corrupted. Most of them have have been corrupted, and uh, and and there were some that that were good, but even they erred in many instances because they were taught by the precepts of men, right? And so so there there is a lot of of I think there's a lot of people out there, but they don't know where the truth is because uh, they're kept from it. And that's in and out of the church, right? You know, there's 
There's a, a lot of people that have, have sent me emails over over the last year or however long it's been that they'll say things like, I've been a member, I'm 70 years old or I'm 65 years old and I haven't read any of this. And but it's been available my whole life. And so I, I think I think that there's a lot of people, but then I think there's a lot of people that are kept from the truth because they they just don't know where to find it. They, they're just not. I, I think a lot of people think that it's just supposed to be handed to them on Sunday during sacrament meeting and, and through Sunday school like that. That was just their thought. And they didn't realize that there was so there was so much of a wealth of knowledge in the church just waiting there to be tapped into that, that that's not what the church is designed for right the church is designed to to take people from a very nasty state and get them at like a terrestrial state right it's not designed it's not designed for anything really more than that the the church buildings the temple right that that you know there's there's another layer right church isn't the end goal and and i hope and i'm, I'm reading that a lot of people are realizing that once you don't have the temples, we're realizing, geez, like that's the end goal. So, um, so I, I think that we're running into a really interesting time period right now because I think that there we're reaching the or we have reached the time period of men lifting up their voices and cursing God and dying or standing in holy places. And President Nelson has identified the battle lines upon which that is going to be fought. Lazy learners and lax disciples or people that are going to put in the work. But there's also that third group that's just confused, right? We learn about those in 2 Nephi 27. Remember when at the end of the chapter it says, and those that erred in doctrine were corrected. There's that process where there, there is a group of people that, that just they've been taught by by priestcraft and they've been taught by people that probably shouldn't be teaching and and they're confused and even they'll they'll be brought but those battle lines are being drawn in the 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 the, the sand right now we're deciding right now if we're going to lift up our voice and curse god and die or if we're going to become real disciples that really want to learn and and so we're interesting an interesting time period because where are these people go for their knowledge? Like, where are they going to go? If none of us open our mouths and say, Zion, the new Jerusalem, Zion, the new Jerusalem, if none of us say, hey, you know, we need to have faith as a brother of Jared. If, if none of us open our mouth, then that means that they're going to go to other people who who are going to be the, you know, in many cases, they were they did err because they were taught by the precepts of men. If we don't open our mouth and teach correct doctrines, they're going to go off and get the testimony from men from other locations that are going to be less reliable. So we are entering a very unique time period. And and, and I've said this as far back as my seventh seal uh, not to be 2000, when I said I hope that when these things fall apart and the great and dreadful day doesn't happen in 2020, I hope that then when people start going and looking for more reliable sources, they will find this. We're entering that time period. We're entering the time period where these false ideas are being proved utterly false. And these people are going to start looking for for more sound doctrine and more uh, concrete evidences and this is where they need to be. you whoever's listening to this who who have a sound mind and know the scriptures and know the lectures on faith and know the doctrine and covenants and know the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith you are the people that need to be opening your mouths and, and being beacons for people as we go into this especially as things get more and more difficult, like uh, like Brett was talking about earlier, like this this is just a this is gonna, this is probably going to get worse. And in fact, uh, the the two brothers, two brothers, Aaron and uh, Christopher, uh, in their new channel channel YouTube channel, which I highly recommend checking out, it was fantastic. Uh, they, have they just talked about in the last video that things could be getting worse, and if things I believe are going to get worse because of where we are in the prophetic timeline. People need to know what's coming. People, people need to know that, that you know that, you know it goes back to, to what Joker said to Batman, or it was a Two Face. That it all goes back to what Joker said to Two Face, where he said that if people if people believe that there is a plan, nobody panics. Nobody plan. Nobody pa panics when you believe it's all according to plan. But when people don't know what. 
Yeah, no matter how horrible the plan is, as long as people believe that, the, that there is a plan, then they, they relax. They're okay with it. There it is. And we could be entering some really horrendous time periods. And if people don't know the plan, they're going to start panicking. And, and, and they're going to be full of fear. We have the gospel and we have the truth and we need to get, if we don't have the knowledge and we don't have the truth, get it. Start studying more. Open up the, the Latter-day Saint teaching manuals, uh, you know, and crack them open. Uh, Elder uh, President Harold B. Lee gave a, a wonderful set of scriptures for, for you to go through if you want to understand last day timelines. I believe it was like uh, Dr. Gummins 38, Dr. Gummins 45, Joseph Smith Matthew, um, he listed some of those, maybe Dr. Gummins 98, I can't remember. Um, and many, so read those and then go into the, the Latter-day Saint, um, uh, student manuals and read everything that they have there. Then go back and read the old student manuals and read everything they have there. If you don't know the doctrine, learn it so that when these things start, start happening, you can help them so that you can, you can be this anchor. You know, just like I said with, about with Gordon B, President Gordon B. Hinckley, where he said, lean on me. You can be these anchors in people's lives. You have the potential to be this. And I dare say that the Lord put you on this earth at this time and put you in this group or at this time to be these anchors for people in this time period and in their life. So well, be what you were I, born to be. I, I, yeah. I think. Go ahead, Marla. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, if I could say a couple of things. I just saw Establishing Zion said here, we will open our mouths. I'm, I'm sorry, my window's in the way. I'm working on having more courage to open my mouth. And I just want to say that I can testify to the fact that the more we study the scriptures and the doctrine and the words of the prophets, the more not only does it become ingrained in us and so it becomes part of our just natural speak we don't even have to think about it it's just part of what we're saying naturally um but we we also become aware like michael was saying we start to become aware of timelines points of references and we recognize things and all of a sudden we're there with people at church or friends or whatever and they're talking about some thing happening and we're and then we just start our, our mouths it's horrible sometimes. Sometimes my mouth just falls open and I'm saying stuff and then people are looking at me weird. Um, but it's because it's because when you study, it becomes part of who you are. And so if you feel like you're not being able to open your mouth and speak, you've got to you've got to increase your studying and your prayer. Um, and then also just another thought about, you know, wondering if, you know, our, our group is, is the only group or you know I've had kind of some thoughts about that too and you know are, are there others out there and um, you know first of all yes I know there are others out there um, I have as I as I talk with people I start to identify people who who are aware of things and and wanting to to move forward and do things and and others who just kind of shut down when when you mention anything and um, and we, we need to be careful as a group who, who are, are working together to um, strive to, to be a righteous people, to do what Heavenly Father wants us to do, and to build Zion. We, we also need to be cautious of the, um, the, uh, the, the moat in our eye, right? And, and, and make sure that we we are not saying that um, how, how good we are versus <laughs> versus them or or the um, the uh, the Zoramites on the Ramiumpton thank you father for how righteous we are <laughs> compared to them and so you know um, we just need to make sure that we we do not turn into that because we are, are blinded by um, by what we see as as great and um and so yes there are other people out there and they are they are contributing and they are building in their way as well not everyone contributes and builds by going on youtube and talking or by talking 
in um, you know social media groups and things like that. They do it in different ways, and they are just as determined and and focused as as others. So, and that's what I wanted to say. All right. Um, I, I just want to add to that that um, I, I think it's important for for those who who are aware of the last day timelines and who are seeing things happening and and seeing events unfolding like COVID and the Assyrian and, and all this this fun stuff. Um, we may be we may start off being alone, but things are going to progress according to that timeline, whether we like it or not. And when we have have the, the courage to stand up and, and be the only person in the ward who who is the, the, the freak talking about the, these things, as things get worse and as things move along, more people are going to wake up and they're going to start saying, hey, you know, what, 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 Joe Schmo was was saying is 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 right, or it makes sense. And there's there's going to be more people, even as they wake up, um, that that just that that will, that will come to you, and will, will talk to you, and, and you'll start kind of forming groups um, based on that. Um, and then also, um, you you will be surprised when you start talking who else feels like you feel and thinks like you think um, even people you, you never would have guessed will, will, will come at you and say hey you know I'm, I'm thinking the same thing too um, and so you, you never know who, who you're going to affect but at some point someone's got to gotta stand up and, and start trying to be the ensign and start trying to be the one that that, that brings these things to light even when if it's uncomfortable and gets people in your work talking about it um uh, there's going there's always going to be people who are who are naysayers and there's always going to be people who are you know not wanting to accept it and that's another big problem we as americans and latter-day saints have is we can't accept that that there is the remotest possibility that someone could ever do harm or do wrong to anyone it's this remote foreign idea and we need to get really comfortable with the idea that that persecution is coming guys and it, it's going to hit the saints hard it it has to there the the stakes of zion have have to be have to be cleansed um it, uh, upon my house it shall begin um first among those among you who have professed my name and have not known um but just we got to start standing up, guys. We, we got to find the courage to just just speak about things, um, start talking about things, and and uh, you'll be surprised who who will start listening and who will start just talking with you, or even you know they may start seeing you know patterns developing in society and around the world, and they'll they they see things happen, but they don't know how to phrase it. They don't know where to put things, but if you start saying, "Hey, we're at X, Y, and Z in the timeline," um, they may very well start looking at you and saying, "Hey, you know, you can help me understand this." And um, so, just just have courage, guys, and, and start start speaking. And once you speaking about these things and about doctrine, um, even missionary work, I'm sure like Mike can attest, it's it's hard at first, but like anything that's hard at first, once you start doing it and you've done it three or four times, you don't even think about it anymore. It just like, like Marlene said, it just comes out of you. It, it just becomes natural. So I want to leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So, um, the, what Marlene said there sparked something in my mind about the, the, the moat and you don't want to be self-righteous and uh, th there's something else that Jesus taught that that actually will help us to to not become self righteous and to not fall into that. And and it was when Jesus taught who the greatest was in the kingdom of uh, of the of the Father. And what did he say? So he said he said he who wants to be the greatest is what 
The least and the servant of all. The least and the servant of all. There it is. So you want to be the greatest in the kingdom of God? Do, ask what I can give. And, and that's why I, I, I've, I've said that. The focus needs to be on what am I willing to give? And when you're focused on what am I, what is Micah willing to give? I'm not so much focused on, okay, is John giving something? You know, uh, is is Peter giving something? Like, you know, are they on board? Uh, you know, because it, it's, okay, they might not be. But is them, are them making it in that regard pertinent to my salvation? No. I need to be willing to sacrifice. I need to be willing to give everything. And, uh, and, and what uh, Marlene said is some people's everything, you know, part of that might be going on YouTube. But for a lot of people, it's probably not, okay? A lot of people that might be, you know, visiting their next-door neighbor, John, but I can't visit your next-door neighbor, John, right? These these are, giving your all is something that is, that obviously is tied to the commandments. Everyone has to live those. So we obviously have to, you know, do temple work. We all have to open our mouth. We all have to do that. But in what area and what sphere? Like I said repeatedly, like for, over and over and over again, I was content with doing missionary work in my neck of the wood, wherever it was. I'm in a district. I'm in a branch. I love missionary work. I'm content with doing it right where I am with people I can see, people that I can shake their hands. I, I was content with that. I was driven on onto YouTube. Um, it's different for everyone. It's different for everyone. But But the underlying command is still the same. Give everything for Zion right? It's the same thing that we all commit to in the temple when we when we uh, we nod our head and we say yes to giving all of our hearts, our minds, our efforts, everything to the building up of the, of the kingdom of God, everything. Give it all. We need to be willing to give it all. Are there people who want to win a Super Bowl? Are there people who want um, to, um, to, to build a Zion or get a Zion? Yes. Do we have do we have enough people that are willing to sacrifice everything to get it? Well, how does that start? It starts one person at a time, one family at a time, as we individually and then families and then collectively are willing to sacrifice everything and be completely obedient, or another way of saying it is let God prevail so that someday, shortly, we can prevail with God that that's the concept of it. You know, that's how we slowly progress. As, as I went over in the paper, uh, uh, The Power of the Lamb, uh, you know, we're also, uh, and Elder Orson Pratt was teaching, it starts it starts with an example, just like the testimony that we went over in the Lecture on Faith today. It begins with the testimony. It begins at headquarters. It will begin, as Brett said, at my house, and it will go out from my house. We need to catch the fire, be willing to sacrifice all, gain a real testimony, and get that burning. And guess what? It's going to start catching fire like tinder, and it's going to start spreading to other places. Because that's what was prophesied that would happen as the power of the land, lamb begins to descend upon the people of God who are scattered upon all the face of the land. As Elder Pratt explained, it will expand out. It'll start with one person. It'll start with one family. It'll start with one congregation or whatever, and it'll expand out. And we will eventually get the redemption and building of New Jerusalem, and then that will expand out. And it'll expand out and expand out until eventually this entire world is uh, subdued and under the feet of our Savior. But the way we keep ourselves humble, the way we keep ourselves from from pointing, uh, or from from being, being too self-righteous is as I've constantly said, we need to stop looking out. We need to stop looking at prophecies and saying it refers to other people. We need to stop doing that. We need to start stop looking out and start looking in because that's how it begins. It always begins with looking in. And it's the thing we do the least because it's the thing that's the most painful to do. And so we, but we need to be willing to do it. And we need to be willing to do it often. And uh, the other stuff will, will eventually take care of itself. So, 
Um, I, there was a question up above. Reba asked about uh, following the keys and uh, doing stuff. I I don't I don't. Re you'd have to be a little more specific on that. I'm, I don't have to. I I'll have to scroll up to find your question. Uh, but I'm just because I didn't want to ignore it. But uh, I. Uh, You'd have to be a little more specific on that. I, I would never, ever, ever suggest doing something against what the keys have told you, you to do. I have I have been one of the most staunch defenders of following what the keys uh, have said every step of the way. Uh, I have never, never deviated an inch on that. When the keys aren't telling you what to do, or when prophets and apostles are teaching doctrine, that now that's a different that's a different subject, right? Because we all make we all make you know grammatical mistakes, and obviously Micah can't pronounce anything, so we don't we don't we you know that's a that's a different ball game. But when the keys say jump, we jump. But uh, if they're not talking, if a stake president isn't talking, that doesn't mean that we can't be doing something. So anyway, she said I answered it. So okay, that's good. Um. I'm trying to see here if there's any more questions. Anybody else see any questions here? Yeah, so I'm not. I haven't seen a lot of questions. It's a lot of chatting back and forth. So, so uh, brother Rick is talking about how he got people on board with some uh, some uh, temporal preparedness. That's fantastic. John's here saying, "Does anyone think it is interesting that the name of the virus that unleashed the desolating sickness, Corona?" <laughs> ultimately leads to the anointing or coronation. Mm, touche. Touche. <laughs> That's clever, John. But I will say, I will say this, because everyone's trying to kind of downplay themselves a little bit, I think. And I will say this, that uh, you are agents on yourself and you have so much more power than, than you realize. You so so much more power. You know, I, I you know, it, it's so hard for me so hard for me to to uh, convey that accurately because whenever I try to convey that accurately, people think I'm boasting about myself. And so it's so hard because I, I want to convey that you have more power in the Lord than you realize by giving you a personal experiences. But then people say, you know, might think that you're bragging, but it's just, it's just my experience. And my experience has been that since I have been home for my mission, Every single unit I have been in has become the highest baptizing area in the, in that mission. Okay, one person can have that much impact on a unit with the missionary work. Now that's one person. Now if I if I sat around and I just said, oh, well, you know, the Lord didn't tell me to do something specifically, and and uh, you know, I, I'll just wait, and it's not my responsibility. No. It is, you know, this is something I'm passionate about, and, and frankly, I've acquired the skills for. So I go up and offer my skills. Hey, I have some time on these days. If you ever want to use me as a resource, use me. I don't need the keys to do that. You don't need the keys to do that. You, you're, you like in Discord, there was an, an individual who does sourdough starters, and it's like, it does, don't overlook things like that. There might be women in your unit. That would love to learn how to do that so they can be more temporally prepared. I'll go up out of your way and just say, hey, I have these skills. Put me to use. And here's when I'm available. And and, and so and don't undervalue the 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 impact that you can have in these individual spheres. Y you can have massive impact you know, in these fears, when, when, when your desire is to build up Zion and your faith is grounded in the Lord to make up the difference and, and you're not doing it for personal gain or glory, you man, I can promise you that just don't tell yourself, Oh, I'm just one person. No, you can do something. Jesus was one man and he did something that was infinite. And uh, Jesus said that you can do all things with me. So you have the same potential. Joseph Smith was one man, right? One man, one woman has has the power uh, to do far more than than they um, than than they're giving themselves credit credit for. And that is Satan. That is Satan whispering in your ear, saying you're not good enough. You can't do it. You know what? You might not be good enough. You might not be able to do it. That's the problem with Satan. He whispers those half-truths in your ear. 
But with Jesus, you can absolutely do it. And you are absolutely good enough. And he will absolutely make up the difference. You have that, you have that power to, to, to be agents and to, and to do much good where you are, right? Me doing stuff on YouTube, I, I still need to do my ministry, right? I still need to, to, to do stuff with my family. I, I, you know, it, it isn't, it, your life shouldn't be one aspect. I still do stuff with the missionaries all the time, right? Like your life should be consumed in the gospel. And as it's consumed in the gospel, your life will, for the first time since being born and since, you know, doing these things, you will have that knowledge and you'll have true joy and happiness. Like I, I, I can promise yeah, yeah. you that. Uh, Brigham Young actually made uh, a few comments with that. Um, I was listening to uh, a talk by uh, one of the teachers at Brigham Young University. Anyway, um, Brigham Young said that um, he said he said he said almost something to that effect. He said, "I want you to wear out your lives in in the gospel. I want you to be exhausted. I want you to be to 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 spend it all. You know that that kind of thing." And I. I think that that's absolutely right. So now we got to, how do we, we got to get off, um, the Babylon, um, uh, and, uh, get more into doing anything, everything gospel related. So, yeah. Mike, are you there still? Yeah, I'm still here. I'm just, I'm thinking about that. That's, and that's right. I, you know, that's right. So it's true. I mean, I think if, if we all could like really see, oh, I feel like I've meant, I've mentioned this. Oh, what was it? When I talked about like um, the consider the lilies, one of my videos that like, like, yes, of course, we have to live like our, our regular lives. We can't just forget about feeding ourselves and and having a job to be able to pay for a house, you know, different things. Of course, we can't just like forget about that. But but that can't be our main focus, just getting a house, just having like a, a big, nice job, nice cars, um, just going on the next family vacation. Um, our focus, first and foremost, has to be on the the things of God and his kingdom and building up his kingdom. And, uh, and, and when we do those things first, then the other things, and that's consider the lilies, the other things just, they seem to work themselves out. And so instead of us spending most of our time concerned about those other things, the things of the world in Babylon, when we are most of the time concerned about the things of the kingdom of God, then the other things that have to get done too work themselves out and get done as well. And it's, it's, this, it's amazing. You know, in conjunction with that, I just had this, this thought, you know, we, Brett mentioned earlier, like, do you feel like sometimes feel alone? Um, the, the two brothers that I mentioned before that, that have that YouTube channel, um, which I'm going to be adding to the channels of my uh, YouTube channel. I, I absolutely love these two. Um, but they said the same thing, that many people said they felt alone, they felt alone, felt alone. Well, here is something that is within your power, that is within your power. When you see somebody doing something that you think, wow, that is Zion-like. Good for them. I am so grateful that they did this. It didn't have to be to you. It could be to somebody else, right? Like It doesn't have to be a direct blessing to you, but you just have recognized that what they've done is a really good thing. What do you do with it? Far too often we do nothing, and that is why we feel alone. Instead, when you see somebody do something good, build them up. Far too often... We're quick to, to point out wrongs, and and this is a society, right? We have speed limits where you get a ticket for uh, you know going over, but nobody's going to reward me for not having a single ticket in my entire life. There's not, they're, they're, we're far too uh, centered on the punishment and not on the reward. 
When you see somebody doing something good, when you say, man, I want more people to be like you, do something, go out of your way to, to build them up, to make them smile, to, to say, keep doing what you're doing. And, 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 and you know what's going to happen? They're going to keep doing what they're doing, hopefully, but then they won't feel alone anymore because they might be feeling alone. You might look at that person and go, man, that is a good saint. They're doing all of this wonderful stuff. That's amazing. And you know what, what happens? Nobody has ever told them that. They are constantly working and they are constantly trying to do the best. And everyone's just assuming that everyone's super grateful for it and, and is building them up. And there's nobody that they feel completely alone. Like there is no Zion. So that's, the, that's something that we can all do very easily right? Be good. Be, be positive. Build somebody up when you see them do something good. You see somebody, you know, uh, cleaning up and putting away chairs in the church, go out of your way and, and say, if it's a young man and say, hey, you want to go outside and get a banana split? You know, you want to, let me go out. Let's, let's reward you for this behavior. You know, we can, and, and far, far too many times I find that that isn't done. We have the ability to reward people far more than, than we do. And what President Benson said in his talk, Beware of Pride, is withholding those gifts is a sign of pride. Withholding gifts and praise that could lift another is pride. And pride is primarily the thing holding us back from Zion. So... You, you want a way that you can light the flame and help other people and make people not feel alone and expand the group? When you see somebody in your unit, your ward, your branch, your stake, doing something Zion-like, point it out and build them up. If they're 12 years old, if, if, if it doesn't matter. If they're eight, build them up. And uh, I, I can promise you that, uh, that you go out of your way to build up Christ's children christ will then go out of his way to doubly build you up and so you feel like you're a little bit down in the dumps go off and try to build somebody else up that's doing good and uh you you will immediately see results you immediately will see results build people up and uh, i'm running out of time here so i will just Bear my testimony here, and I will let the other two, if they want to say something as well before I close, that I know the church is true, and I know the prophets hold the keys of salvation, and when they speak holding the keys, we need to listen, and we need to do. But everything else, when they're not speaking, that's on us. And we can build Zion in our own home, in our own heart, and, and we can do that by, by being obedient, exactly obedient, and by having the faith as a brother of Jared. And, and as we learn these lectures on faith and we learn what's required of us, we can have a better desire and, and an understanding of what we need to do and instill these things and this hope and this love of Christ in our children and those around us. And it doesn't matter if you have a child, right? If you don't have a child, if you're a grandmother or or anything like that, like, like Fire and I said earlier, you are still a part of Zion and you can still help build these people up. You can still help build them up. When you see a child or, or somebody in your in your branch or war doing something good, build them up. And you can be that in their life. And I can testify and know that when you have done it unto the least of these, the, bro the of his brother. Now, what does that mean? The, the person in your branch that you think is the worst, <laughs> the least, the, the one that's just like, oh my gosh, does Jesus love this one? When you've done it even unto that one, you've done it unto Jesus. Okay, so we can start by the people that, we, that are doing good things, right? That should be easy for us. These are people that we should be, it should be really easy for us to reward and build up, right? Let's start with that. And that's my commitment to all of you. And, and I pray that we can all do this, get this faith, and that we can build Zion and New Jerusalem because that is the only way we're going to escape the scourge that will be upon us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. God bless, Godspeed, keep the faith. Did either of you have anything else, or was that it? Oh, okay. I got the delay to go first. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, was it the? Uh... Anyways, um, so I just wanted to say that um, 
You know, we, we had a, um, there was a little discussion on, uh, on discord about ministering and, um, Ministering is something that I have an immense testimony of, and and I am under the belief that if we all ministered in the way that we were supposed to, um, actually taking responsibility for those that we have stewardship over, that we would we would have Zion here already, and so just. Um, building upon Micah's testimony that, um, you know, start, start with those that you have stewardship over, you will be responsible for them. And so if, if you are brushing them aside, you are condemning yourself. And so start with them, start by building them up. Those that you minister to those that you teach to in your classes or whatever callings you have those in your families, Start there, building them up, and then reach out from there. And I just cannot, I wish it's something that, you know, I wish I could, like, take out of my own heart and dump into the computer and everyone would understand. Like, when we do Heavenly Father's work first, when we take care of Heavenly Father's children first, things in our own lives are just taken care of. And we will, it's not that it's like easy and it's just like, oh yeah, you know, no big deal. It's still hard. It's still a trial, but he takes, he fights the battles for us. And, and so when we can do that, when, when the members as a whole can do that, then we will have Zion because there is no way that Christ is going to come to a people who cannot minister to each other. That I know is a fact. And so start ministering. And I say these things in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, so I was thinking about what Micah said earlier about the about in the lectures of faith. There's something initially that that ignites something in people's minds. Um, one of the in, in marketing, one of the, the, the hardest thing to do is just get your name out there. So sometimes Bad press is good press because it makes people aware of your existence. So in a similar vein, if people have hard questions about the church or if they have hard – or if they have questions about the, the doctrine, just be honest and outright. You, you never know when, when, when someone – you may make someone just fly off their hinges by – you know, um, suggesting exaltation or, 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 or godhood or the return of just Smith. <laughs> That's a fun one to throw out there. Um, but it, it activates people's minds. It gets them engaged. And even if they, they hate your guts for it and they, they revile you and persecute you, um, it, it got them involved. Um, the opposite of love is is not hate. It's apathy. Apathy is when you just walk away from the from the relationship. As long as people are still hating you, they're still involved. Um, I'm not suggesting you try to make people hate you, but um, you've got to prick hearts somehow. Um, I actually was just just last night I was having a conversation with some people who were who were Messianic Jews. It's the best way to, to describe their their religious belief, but they read scripture. I mean, we we talked for four hours about the gospel, and they they knew the Old Testament, the New Testament, front and back. I would start off, you know, quoting things. They would they would finish it. Um, but you know, when when I when I when I threw out there, you know, one of my my big um, bristling of the spine moments in gospel conversation is when we, we start breaching into the territory of, of exaltation. Um, I'm always worried that people are going to be like, what? That's crazy. That's out outrageous. But more times than not, people go, oh, we're children of a God, so we have the capacity to become like our Father. That's reasonable. You know, people don't react as badly 
as as they as you might think they do. But if they do, then then that's fine because that 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 puts something in them for them to process and work on and think about. And if you're if you're so brazen and so bold, you can go back to them later after they've had time to think about it and calm down. Um, you can ask them. So what do you think about it now? And you know, I, I think most people will will still uh, they'll process, they'll think. And if you have the 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 courage to go back and, and ask about that heart doctrine, then it, it shows you're convicted, you're you're sincere. It and it, it helps them to to know you really believe what you believe. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Amen. Hey. Amen. <laughs> I had to grab the mic. All right. God bless. God speak. Keep the faith. We'll talk to you again very soon. <laughs>